Spoilers? Check. Mature language? Check. Viewers beware? Check. So, who would like to start? Mr. Barnes, why does Sam aggravate you? 15 seconds to drop! So what's our plan? Great. Superheroes cannot be allowed to exist. I have no intention to leave my work unfinished. The world's upside down right now. Where do we start? Playing. Oh yeah? What is it? Is you ready? Ready, ready? Here we go again, huh? We've been grinding hard on the job. Can't take that from us. Are you ready? Oh. Is you ready? Ready? Is you ready? Oh. Ready? Ready? Is you ready? Ready? Oh. Are you ready? Ready? Is you ready? 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 Hello, girl. Kick your ass. Ah! See? That wasn't so hard. Are you ready? Oh. Is you ready? ready? Okay. You say you ready. What are you doing? Ready. Ready. Are you having a staring you contest? Oh. Are you ready? Ready. Ready. Is you ready? ready? Just blank, sweet Jesus. I mean, how old are you? By the way, I'm I'm fucking loving, uh, and, you know, I, I don't want to say for the podcast or we'll get to it soon enough. I'm loving fucking uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. I, I loved the first two episodes. Third episode, eh, I understand they're going to have to have some set up shit. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was not a huge fan of this last episode. Mm-hmm. It wasn't bad. Uh, you know what's so nice, though? We're halfway through the series now. We've seen three right. episodes. We're halfway through. The problem, though, let's see. But the problem, though, is like if it was nine or ten episodes, I I would give one bad episode a slide, but you've only got six to go. Mm-hmm. You've only got six total. So I'm like, one shitty episode freaks me out. Mm-hmm. Um, so, well, and, but, and we have a difference of opinion too, because I, I don't see it as a shitty episode. Uh, I mean, I didn't say shitty. It's not mm-hmm. shitty. Just n- it didn't progress the story as much as I wanted it to. Yeah, it feels like it's one of those deals, kind of a little bit of uh, uh, dumb Nolan kind of action, where it's like they're throwing a bunch of complications to them getting to where they're needing to be, but the complications aren't particularly well uh, written well handled and mostly just seemed like an excuse to get the people into one place together and to, you know do stuff with them but the plot isn't strong just simple as that I don't think the plot's very strong with it uh, for me it's more getting off to all the Captain America stuff that I didn't get to see in the movies um, and, yeah, I, yeah I will say I, I re- like like when he's at the bank trying to get the fucking loan yeah. and you find out the Avengers I was like this is the shit that I and, and Winter Soldier seeing his therapist and I'm like okay this is the shit I'm down for mm-hmm. um like the it almost got too big shit. too fast, right? It was so good at doing that human stuff, that real life stuff, that they, they almost immediately go into the more superhero shit. And it's like, but I kind of want to see a little bit more. I want to spend a little more time with some of these other people, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I hope they get back there. But at this point, they're just there's too many characters starting to get involved. And I'm like, you're not going to be able to get back to all this. You know, they're going to tie up the stuff with his sister in a little tiny little bow at the very end of the movie. I'm going to be kind of pissed off. Or at the end of the show, I'm going to be pissed off because I was like, I actually give a shit about that. Um, So, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Like, and Zemo's still not Zemo yet, and we're halfway through the series, and it's like, eh, oh, like, okay. Like, next episode, better blow some fucking doors off, or I'm going to start to kind of turn on the show a little bit. Not a lot, just a t- just a tiny bit. It's still definitely not bad. We're still enjoying all the episodes. Uh, but the first two episodes were so fucking good. And they also do lots, lots of weird editing in this show. Uh, like, like, in the, I don't know if it was the second episode, where they were getting in the trucks, where they were going after the Super Soldier Serum, and they sneak into the middle truck. There's a truck right behind them. Mm-hmm. Why? 
watching them open the doors to the fucking track. Oh, yeah, and climb Nikita and was like, what is that? What's that? Yeah, she, was, she, what the fuck is going on? Like, this is so stupid. Why didn't you have them break into the last truck? Like, th- what the fuck? They're just staring at you through the windshield of the truck. And then in this last episode, the way they're like surrounded in the building after Homegirl gets shot. And then it's just suddenly like they're in his S-Class Mercedes leving. And it's just like, what? what? How did they get out? I don't yeah, yeah. To- they, hey, that's true. That's one thing that bugged me is they did. They worked too hard to set up how dangerous this place was. Exactly. And how they, you know, everybody's going to be coming at them and it's, it's going to be like the warriors and shit. And then it's like they ran down an alley. Three people got shot and they just sort of like walked it off from there. And it's yeah. like, you guys, you guys built this place up way too much to peter stuff out like that, that fucking Stuff dark. like that bothers the shit out of me, dude. That's not suspension of disbelief. That, to me, that's just sloppy storytelling. Yeah. Um, they did some of that in the first episode when they were, you know, flying around on the helicopters and shit where the dude like blows the door open on that, uh, the aircraft carrier or the, uh, the huge cargo plane they're in. They're in. The doors blow off. There should have been like some explosive decompression and instead they were all just like standing around and it was like, what? Like they just blew the door open. Why are you all not getting sucked out of the thing? Uh, stuff like that really bothers the shit out of me. And and I say that because it's that kind of shit that bothered me in Wonder Woman 84 too. Like just the storytelling was so sloppy and characters just appeared in other places and they just went to some places for seemingly no fucking reason at all. That stuff really gets them. That gives them my, gets my nerves more than invented powers and people who become superhuman when they're not supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like that shit gets on my nerves more. And this show's got a lot of that and I'm trying to just let it go because it seems to be kind of consistently doing it. But like you said, they built up how hard it was for them to get in to see her and then they just fucking waltzed out and I'm like, okay, come on guys. Like, you've got you've got more time than this. You can't say, oh, well, it's a TV show. We gotta rush through the shit. Well, you got a little more time. You got a little yeah. more time. Here. Maybe a little less time fighting amongst like storage cases, you know, uh, uh, and more time and yeah, showing dude. how dangerous this shit was. Yeah. Although, uh, Sharon Carter got fucked up and it was so funny. I was just about to make this point in one of our podcasts. I, I had like bookmarked a point to make about how it, the inclusion of more and more female superheroes means that these women are going to have to get their asses kicked. Mm-hmm. But like they never do. <laughs> like Wonder Woman never has a scratch on her and mm-hmm. all the, no matter how hard she's hit, they never put a scratch on her. And I'm like, is it, they're like weirdly protecting these women, mm-hmm. which I think is this weird dichotomy of you don't want to watch a woman get brutalized by some man in a movie. But also if you want the woman to be a fucking huge superhero, she's going to have to get into fights, right? Mm-hmm. So other than uh, maybe Scarlett Johansson kind of get the shit beat out of her in some of these movies. Uh, other than that, like none of these women ever get hurt, uh, except as I, I was like tabling this point to make in a future podcast, Sharon Carter gets the shit kicked out of her <laughs> in this movie, dude. Like she's like, she's got fucking blood coming off. Her. I think she's got a cut on her face and she, her lips bleeding and stuff. Uh, it, and I was like, oh, okay, well, you know, at least, uh, you know, Agent Carter got the shit kicked out of her. But mm-hmm. uh, anyway, it was just funny. It was just serendipitous. But even with her, too, she was like, hey, you guys are at my house. Better get some clothes to fit you. Now there's a party. And there's like a party. And I'm just like, what the fuck is going on? Right, right. That was oh. really random. Yeah, like super like weird. And then like the I know it's gone a little viral, the Zemo dancing. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, no, I didn't need that. You no, know, no. I, I, well, and again, there's elements of that Zemo that I like and, and recall the comic Zemo. But there's still this like nerdiness about him. And it just like, again, like the dancing thing. It's like, ah, uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eh. yeah. But so, you know, so no, you're not like yucking that. my yum, but but I'm aware that there were things about it to, to take issue with. Yeah, little things like that are kind of getting on my nerves. Um, so yeah, I'm just I'm glad, but, but compared to WandaVision, I'm not like a weekly hate watch with this shit, you know. So just that in mm-hmm. itself is uh, nice. Also, either I'm better at avoiding the spoilers, or just in as much spoiler stuff trending. I guess because there's not maybe maybe people's expectations are a little bit tempered by WandaVision, so they're not throwing out these bizarre speculation. I think that's what it is. I think um, that's what it is. I, I, think, I think people cooled off and it's not so abstract mm-hmm. that you can literally make shit up mm-hmm. because Wanda can literally make shit up. Mm-hmm. It's sort of like, who's the power broker? So you got to guess who the power broker is. Like that, that's kind of, that's the conspiracy. Like, so is it Zemo? Is it somebody working the U.S. government who's feeding super soldier serum to to the back to the United States so Johnny Walker can get like does Johnny Walker have the super soldier serum? How did he get it? He had to have got it from the power. You know what I mean? Like those are kind of things, but they're sort of like surface level compared to the WandaVision shit where you can literally just say any random person walking on the set is some any number of characters in the Marvel mm-hmm. Universe. To me, that show lent itself 
to more uh, speculation. Well, and just the simple fact that we all know it's leading into Doctor Strange, and so it's like multiverse of madness. We can introduce the X Men, but what's funny is like literally, like you know, they're they're introducing like major elements from the X Men stories exactly. in the Captain America show, and people aren't like going nuts over it. It's like no, this is this is really happening. This isn't just some stupid bullshit you're pulling out of your ass. Wait, 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 wait. wait what are you talking about? What do you mean? You said they're they're introducing X Men stuff in the Captain America show. Yeah, like the the, 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 the what's the name of the island? Oh, I don't know. Did they say that? Oh. Uh, um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Madrimore or some shit Madripoor, like that? yeah. And Madripoor was where, like, the first, I don't know, four years of Wolverine solo series was set? Gotcha. I knew it sounded familiar. Yeah. I, I thought you meant, I, at first I thought you said Wonder Vision because they had the X-Men universe Quicksilver. Yeah. Where yeah. They're, like, they're and then they, then they end up, you know, they put that on the table and they pull it back off again. It's like, no, he's a boner. <laughs> um, and so, but, like, literally, like, okay, well, Madripoor me, it is not ambiguous. This isn't like, oh, yeah, but Hawkeye used to hang out in Madripoor, too. Like, this is Wolverine playing. Nobody else was in Madripoor. You know, the X-Men yep. and Wolverine were in Madripoor. Madripoor's been introduced in the Captain America show. That's real. That means that you've got, you know, X shit going on. They're, they're already laying that down in a way they didn't legitimately do on WandaVision, but nobody's losing their shit over it this time. I don't know. Maybe it's too much of a show. Maybe it's too grounded of a show. Or maybe people felt burnt by WandaVision. But it's like, no, we're really doing shit. Like, you know, you, you kept thinking, well, what if the fly is Mephisto? It's like, yeah, but you got fucking Isaiah Washington from The Truth Right fucking here, dude. You didn't know that she was coming. The advertisements, there's nothing in advertisement that you know they were going to get involved with some Flag Smasher. Uh, you know, there's all this shit that's actually happening on uh, uh, this show and it's not, like, blowing up the internets. Uh, and well, then one of no, it no, was no. nothing but smoke and mirrors and they couldn't fucking stop talking about that shit. The stuff that bl- that's blowing up the internet is the not my cap for Johnny Walker and how mm. everybody fucking hates him and they hate mm. the actor and the actor's getting death threats and shit. Jeez, uh, okay, gee, that's too yeah. much. Come on. He's, yeah, he's a dude, performer in a role. Come on. And I'm like, it's because you motherfuckers don't read the comic books like johnny walker is supposed to be an asshole yeah the dude is, is perfect this guy is great if he's grading you when you see him on the screen that's how it's supposed to be even cat fucking hated johnny walker like, this I, I, is- honestly my problem is he's too sympathetic so far my concern though is again we're only halfway through and there is a sense that you know the show is going to end with you know, perhaps sam becoming captain america and i, I don't think we are going to end up spending enough time with johnny walker to do that journey justice especially considering how this was what a two year arc and Captain America is one of the, the biggest cap stories ever told so six issues is, I mean six episodes is really short shrift especially how little we've actually gotten to see Johnny Walker so uh, I'm, I'm bracing for a disappointment while I'm still currently enjoying it but I'm just kind of bracing for that not ending up paying off the way that I would like it to what I'd yeah, love is I mean, if they would actually do a, a few seasons and let the story breathe more right and because right. uh, I, I would much rather spend more time with the Johnny Walker story and showing his arc <laughs> as opposed to them fucking around in Madripoor, which isn't even Cap territory. At the same time, though, when I see Madripoor and all those lights and stuff, and, and uh, I, you know, I'm, I was totally into it. I was totally like, oh my God, they're going to add Madripoor. And I never fucking liked Madripoor. I didn't like any of that shit from the comic books. It was irritating for, oh, hello. Yeah, man. Sorry. Fucking Windows, man. You there, dude? Yeah. Fucking Windows, dude. But the, that's Did the thing, see? though. Look, dude, you should have got your vaccine. It would have booted right up. This thing was a fucking nightmare. Oh, I'm glad you mentioned that. Let me grab something. I'll be right back. Dude, I was I was literally sitting for 30 minutes for the download, and it goes, oops, can't do it. Got to reverse. And I'm like, motherfucker. And I'm kicking shit and throwing shit around, throwing a tantrum. Getting my blood pressure up, about to drop dead. You sound good now, though. Just FYI. I mean, I don't, I don't know. know. There's all kind of, Dude, it's acting all fucking buggy now. Like, I literally had to hit Skype like five times before it finally opened. Really? So. That sucks. We're talking about Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Oh, fucking fantastic, dude. Zemo dancing? That's my that's my jam. Didn't like it. I thought that was a little annoying. Really? I like that. I, I, it, my, my concern is that we're three of the six episodes in and Zemo still isn't Zemo and instead he's dancing in a fucking club and that's kind of getting on my nerves. I said it, I, I so I love the first two episodes. The third episode is kind of like it's a tipping point for me. If they don't start actually like getting to some real meat of this show soon, I'm going to get a little pissed off. Uh, I think they're going full with the route on next episode. I think so too, but I thought that about WandaVision a couple times too and it ended up not happening. So I just uh, kind of I like the fact that they're so fucking different. Like I like WandaVision, but I wasn't like I got to watch it again real soon. I was like, hey, it was okay. Ah, oh, you Motherfucker, you okay? Yeah, we are on fucking updates. You sound good though, dude. So that's why I don't, I don't understand. I don't know. There's all kinds of stupid shit. Ugh. Should have got that vaccine, man. My Windows oh. is kicking with this vaccine. I got five G. I got everything. Hopefully, I'll be getting it soon. I can get those nanobikes put in me. A star of superheroes has arrived. Fantastic Four. Spider Man.
Okay, we're red. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Marvel Superheroes Podcast. I'm a legal machine with me as Diablo Frank. And then you fix it. And today we're going to talk about Falcon and the Winter Soldier and then go ahead and put in like a trailer here that's like really explosive because we're all like really low key right now. You want a bird? I want my bird. I can get your bird. I can get you 10 birds. I want my bird. Well, okay. Nothing's impossible. I could... Are we talking about, uh, is this a bird back in Russia? And not a reflection of the show, just a reflection of our individual weekends. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, a, I'm tired. I'm sunburned. Uh, yeah, that's mostly it. Yeah, and, and I was like lowering furniture off the sides of balconies and uh, moving and stuff. And uh, then when I got home, I got really involved in projects. And I like all that energy that I had got spent by the time it got time for us to record. So, yeah, I'm about done. And then Fix-It was doing chores and stuff as well. Plus, he got beat up by Mortal Kombat. Yeah. This suit comes with expectations. Let's take the shield, Sam. I have bigger things to worry about. This world is us. You built me. I am Captain America. We can't lose this fight. All episodes now streaming only on Disney+. Plus. So let's talk about Falcon and Winter Soldier. Okay, so Falcon and Winter Soldier is the second sort of... I mean, I don't know. What, what are they called? Mini series. Is it a miniseries? We're calling yeah, it a series? Yeah, it's a miniseries. Uh, from the Marvel Cinematic Universe being adapted to the small screen on Disney+. Plus. First uh, season or first series was WandaVision, which we covered a few weeks ago because that wrapped up. And now it was followed by Falcon and Winter Soldier. Falcon and Winter Soldier is six episodes long. Running What runtime was like 40 minutes a pop, 30. 40, 40 uh, so, somewhere between 45 and an hour, I think, for most of them. Well, I mean, you I don't think any of them broke an hour, but they were, they were like in that realm of like 45 to 55 minutes, roughly. Yeah, but you can't like look at the run times because the, the credits oh, on sure. all these shows point, last point. like 10 minutes. Like WandaVision, it would go through the credits in like six different, uh, what do you call it, uh, languages. Language. Like it, the credit sequences are just forever. They go forever. Uh, so anyway, yeah, pretty reasonably sized show. Um, it stars Anthony Mackie as Sam Wilson and Sebastian Stan as the winter soldier if i remember uh, correctly they're pumping about 150 million dollars into each of these to give them that cinematic quality really oh, you mean, he mean not per episode you mean the series right oh, right series. Okay, the, the, yeah like, so <laughs> for six hours of material 150 million dollars is a ton of money but uh, you know yeah, uh, there were game of thrones seasons that cost 100 million dollars so uh yeah it's, it's it's a substantial amount of money no oh, this stuff looks way better than yeah yeah <laughs> than freaking game of thrones cgi was always so horrible dude. Mm. uh anyway um okay so how do we want to do what do we want to talk about here well i mean uh-huh. I, I, we, I guess we should give an overview of the story okay uh okay so this starts about six months after everybody comes back from the blip in endgame um anthony mackie aka sam wilson at the end of endgame was given captain america shield by steve rogers and was basically given the mantle of captain america who we assume is on the moon actually i, th- I, I had this ar- whole argument with paquita cap should not be in the marvel cinematic universe at this point based on what they this is obviously not something they say in the films which is a problem because you know that's like no prizing fan service type stuff but my understanding is that when he went back in time and he shacked up with Peggy um, that's a separate tangent universe because that didn't happen in our universe therefore he couldn't have gone back in time to be with Peggy Carter so he's in a tangent he, he came to our back to the core universe gave Sam Wilson his shield and then fucked off back to his alternate universe where he's dancing with Peggy Carter until they both die well I guess by this point I, I, she's I, probably I, dead I, anyway you know even in his no, she died in the other one. Yeah, so she's probably dead in that alternate universe as well. But I, I, th- I still think he fucked off back to where he came from, essentially. So you don't think he's on the moon? Uh, that's the th- that's the the uh, he's the with Walt Disney. In the assume, show, right? they keep joking yeah. about him being on the moon. Yeah, he, the, him and the frozen head of Walt Disney are both on the moon. That's correct. I thought that was like a Doctor Manhattan reference, but whatever. Um, I thought that so, was like a Watcher reference. Why would it be? Why would they reference the Watcher? Nobody knows who the Watcher is, dude. He's probably gonna be a big thing in the next few, next wave. But anyway, go ahead. Okay, I, did you just jump to a joke that was in like the fifth or sixth episode? Episode when we're 30 seconds into this podcast. <laughs> I think they did it twice. So maybe it okay. was earlier and we've forgotten. It doesn't matter. Steve Rogers doesn't matter. That's the whole point. We moved on from Steve there, Rogers. There is dead. no cameo. He's, He's only available in print yeah. media in the show. He's fucking dead. So uh, basically what has happened since he was given the shield was the United States government asked for it back. And he was like, did you know they? what? I don't, I don't I wasn't under the impression they had asked for it. I think that he no, surrendered I, it to them. I think they did. I think they kind of asked for it. Because that Valerie character said it's kind of a gray area about the shield. 
shield. Yeah, it's not really the United States property. And yeah, he, and, but they made it sound like it was. Yeah. Okay, I was under the impression it, it, that what it happened. Who made, wait, was it didn't, he, didn't Tony Stark's dad make the shield? Yeah. Who Howard Stark fucking the cares? Yeah. I'm just saying. Who cares, dude? I'm just okay, curious. So the point is, he made a choice and he gave the U.S. government the shield, seemingly based on what we saw in the first episode, under the assumption that they were just going to put it in a museum and let people marvel at the original Cap shield and not do anything untowards with this artifact. And they did, right? There's like a whole... They, they, and they, there's like a, what do you call it, that senator or whatever. They do like an unveiling of the shield and they thank Sam for bringing it and whatnot, right? That's on the first episode, correct? I believe so. Yeah. That, that's cause, yeah, because uh, um, uh, James Rhodes is there giving him the mean mug for doing oh, it. Oh, that's right. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to explain the whole fucking show. Somebody okay. else pick it up. Well, and I'm so, I love that they had Rhodey in the first episode. I love that they built out the, the universe in that way by, by letting us know that all these characters are still interacting. And they were, like, WandaVision was somewhat isolated since it was pretty much just Wanda and Vision. You know, they, they you had some characters, like, well, you had the supporting characters from other shows, but these aren't yeah, like yeah. actual exactly. heroes. You know, it's just like Jimmy Woo and Darcy, and that that shit don't count. It, it only counts when you get a fucking roadie in here. When you got when you give Dan, Don Chula a paycheck and have him show up, then you feel like it's a universe. When they do shit like with Darcy, that's some Agents of Shield kind of continuity. You know, we've done that in the past. That's not impressive. You know, so uh, let's just be honest about it. So anyway, so I don't, I don't remember Rhodey actually having a problem with it. I think he was like, look, hey, you know, you made your call. That's cool and everything. It was really uh, Bucky who was pissed off about the shield being turned over to the government. Although that, I think, doesn't really start to happen until the second episode. So I remember when the first episode was coming out, I was jazzed an- enough about it that I was going to troll people a little bit and be like, yeah, this was better than the Snyder Cut. Just to be, just to be an asshole, mostly. But I did really enjoy that first episode because you start off with that big action sequence where you see the Falcon going after the soldier that's being taken a, 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 to, a, to an enemy country in the Middle East and they only have a limited amount of time to extract him and it can't be an official uh, government proceeding. And so you really get to see the Falcon do cool shit with his wings and, you know, sh- show this guy... Even Red can, Wing. Huh? Even Red Wing was... Was Red Wing cool. in the pilot? Yeah. He's the one that's shooting down the other helicopters with missiles okay. and shit. I was wondering about that because it seemed like Red Wing just disappeared for a good chunk of the sh- series and then turns back up in the final episode. But they did... I thought they did a great job of showing him maneuvering and doing, like, cool Top Gun type shit but with a guy with a pair of wings so that was nice. And he does recover the uh, the soldier that he was searching for. Um, a slight problems I think when they're a little bit of an international incident because he was supposed to be quiet and I was very not quiet uh, I think this whole show they don't really clearly explain who the fuck Falcon's even working for and oh, I mean obviously I like maybe he's given his money problems he's not working for anybody mm-hmm. but he's flying around with a dude in fatigue what's his name Joaquin or whatever uh, Joaquin Torres, Torres. Yeah. I, I mean so is he for the Air Force because Torres yeah, is I an think Air so. Force. he's a military I, he, guy he's definitely he's working with like the military C- yeah he's flying with like big DC 10 or whatever so or what, I don't know I'm not an airplane guy I apologize uh, but you know what I'm saying so but that's a little like I don't know and then and then Bucky's kind of there like okay so well, Bucky I mean, we allowed don't, to just well in the, in the yeah. pilot episode we're not seeing a lot of Bucky Bucky's off doing his own thing he's being see, he's been seeing a, a therapist as part of his parole and he's tr- and he's got to make amends for all these wrongs that he's done having been a programmed assassin for the Soviets and shit and uh, we, you get to see him in flashbacks having nightmares to things that he did while he was the Winter Soldier all these, you know, extra governmental assassinations and shit. And so he's dealing with that, but he's not dealing with that because he's sort of hit a wall. It's like he's done some vigilante stuff where he's taken down people that were put into government positions by Hydra. Um, so that's a, one way of making amends. But in terms of the, the personal stuff where there's no fixing it, there's only him acknowledging the wrong and telling people who don't know what happened, their family members that he killed, that he's the reason why they're dead. Here's why they're dead, that kind of shit. And he can't quite get to that place. So he's working on himself and working on the the post programming but he, he's not fully committed to you know what he's going to need to do uh, uh, according to the therapist that was the therapist that was the um, wife from the Sopranos right could have been I thought Fix it would I, I believe you no I believe. that wasn't the wife from the Th- Sopranos no no that wasn't that who the hell was that then I know that chick mm, uh, that's not I think her name is Edie something no the one that was in oh uh, was she Nurse Jackie Nurse Jackie and all that stuff no wasn't that the wife from S- no that wasn't S- her Sopranos okay I thought anyway so Nurse Jackie went on to become a psychiatrist apparently got off the dope too um so so that's what Bucky's doing for most of the pilot episode. What uh, after the big action sequence at the beginning of the episode.
episode. Sam is back home in Louisiana, right? He's from New Orleans, isn't he? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, mean, I took that to be New Orleans, yeah. yeah and I mean, not, maybe not New Orleans, but, but Louisiana. Louisiana. Yeah, and so his sister's been the one who's had to hold down the fort for years. He got uh, caught up in the blip and disappeared just like Bucky had. And so he comes back and she's been holding everything down, but it's been a struggle because, you know, she's a single mother. Um, she can't get money to make repairs on a boat that's part of their business. Um, she wants to, you know, sell some of the property and he comes back. He's like, no, we're not going to sell the property. And he's thinking, hey, I'm the Falcon. I'm the Falcon. And they're going to go to the bank and based on him being the Falcon, they're going to get a loan to help him without with this stuff. And he has a very rude awakening where they're perfectly happy to take pictures with him and, and try to get autographs and shit, but still no money's coming, which I, I absolutely fucking love that scene. I love when real shit somehow manages to make its way into superhero stuff. Um, so I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. But then at the end of the episode, after he'd given the shield over to the government with the assumption that they were just going to archive it, instead what they did is they come up with a brand new Captain America, uh, John Walker, and he's got a suit and they make sure to shoot him from just the exact wrong angle so that he, while being a handsome guy, they shouldn't have looked like a total Dilbert. And so you've got Sam and his sister at home watching this shit go down, blood boiling, you know, realizing that they'd basically unintentionally sold out the Captain America legacy. And that prompts Bucky to come back and you'd be like, why the fuck did you give up the shield? Why did you give up the shield? He's real fucking been out of shape about it. Eventually find out the reason why that is, is because if Sam gave up the shield and he wasn't up to that after Steve gave him that shield, that made also, that means he was wrong about Sam. And if he's wrong about Sam, then the redemption arc of Bucky is interrupted because he can't stay for sure if he was worth saving either. If he can move past his Winter Soldier past. So there's a lot of psychological shit and and emotional shit going on over the course of this but you have this whole uh, you know um, buddy cop thing where they don't get along and they're only working together because they're they're forced into it uh, basically Bucky tags along as Sam is asked to follow up on this terrorist organization that Joaquin Torres had hipped him to in the first place where they, they essentially are the people who benefited from the blip the snapping whatever the fuck you want to call it which is a, an issue I have with the show because simultaneously I think it's great because one of the things I hated about the blip in the movies is I had no real expectations that they were going to follow up on that in you know going forward that it was just going to be a device used in Endgame and then left behind so it's cool that you've got shows really addressing that this one especially but it's also a little bit naive because the assumption based on what they say on the show is that since there were half as many people as there used to be you needed those the other half of the people to help keep the world going and so they brought people into abandoned homes and gave them jobs and gave them money and shit and you know everybody pulled together globally to make the world work with half the people gone but then the other half of the people came back again and now all those people are being displaced it's like a global Palestine essentially where you got somebody in your house and it's still your house and it doesn't make a ton of sense to me because you still have laws in place and five years isn't enough time for them to stop having things like escrow or you know like it takes seven years before you can even be declared dead legally as I recall and so they're not just going to be opening up all the houses to people because let's be honest there's probably enough houses in the world to put everybody in a fucking house or a lot of the people in the house and we are doing it now so it's a little uh, uh, unbelievable that they were doing it in that situation but that's one of the central premises is that there were people who benefited from the blip who are now being dispossessed again you've got governments that are signing legislation to push these guys back out to the fringes again and they're fighting to maintain that uh, kumbaya global unity and also generally just wanting to smash governments in the first place since they seem to be the problem not the people and one of the main people who's involved with this is a teenager of um, if I recall correctly the actress is part Jamaican part Irish she's very interesting looking because she's got all these freckles and stuff um, the character's name is Carly Morgenthau the actress's name is Erin Kellyman and even though she's a young person she's charismatic enough and focused enough to where she's managed to draw a group of people around her to work with her to try to fight for this, this new global order that she wants to bring about where we set aside the governments and just work together as people but it also helps that she's managed to steal a new version of the super soldier serum that had been generated in, uh, over the course of the blip and given it to her buddies so that you've got they don't become giant swollen people like Captain America was there's no vita rays involved in this process they're just normal looking people who happen to be strong as fuck and uh, you can jump around and do you know super soldier type shit and so they're, you, this small group of people that have this formula are using it to get vaccines and try to get resources for all these displaced people who are getting pushed back into the fringes again but of course governments aren't going to be happy with that and so they're sending Falcon uh, Winter Soldier is tagging along and as they're trying to track these guys down they're also running into the new Captain America John Walker and his buddy Battlestone these guys are Afghan vets who've seen some serious shit and as a result of that the, the US government thinks that John Walker can handle being Captain America 
it even without a super soldier serum. But, you know, even though he's a strong soldier, he's going up against a group of literal super soldiers. And so pretty much all the heroes on the show appear to be out of their depths. And because there were real issues with John Walker taking that shield without really okaying it with guys like Sam Wilson and Bucky, these two groups are not wanting to work together to find these terrorists. And so there's friction between Bucky and Falcon. There's friction between those guys and the new Captain America and Battlestone. And then, of course, there's Battle the friction. Star. Battlestar. It's Battlestar, sorry. Battlestar. Uh, Battlestone is image. I'm, I'm crossing the streams over to Spawnometer. And um, there's also, of course, the friction with these, this group called the Flag Smashers that use technology like cell phone apps in order to facilitate their terrorism. I, I just want to say, I, I didn't have any problem at all with any of the blip stuff. And to me, it made perfect sense. Like, if you had half of an entire company vanish, you would have to get people in there immediately. Like, like industries would collapse without people. So, uh, if, if anything, forget the, the social side of it. The capitalism side of it would have caught would have fixed the displacement it would have brought all these people in just for job you know like i said for jobs and resources yeah I, um, I definitely think that you would have had people filling jobs and there you would need people to do things like infrastructure you know it doesn't matter how many people are on the roads the roads are still going to crack bridges are still going to collapse you still got to get people to do that kind of work um but you also things like ownership of, of actual properties and shit you come back you still own that property so uh, there, there's some of that stuff that the law would cover without them having to sign all this new legislation to do this that the other thing and it'd be hard to believe that there's one piece of legislation that would affect the entire globe either well i mean if half the universe was snapped out of it then you know the, but what i think is funny about it is that it, it once again proves that thanos is probably right <laughs> and it seemed like everything worked better if they snapped half the people away that, it, that keeps popping up in all these things it's like well maybe things things were kind of better for people after the snap all these people who'd been previously um underprivileged suddenly got these jobs and they got these homes they always wanted and everything like that because suddenly there was there were enough resources to go around and now that we're back to 100 percent they get displaced it's like oh thanos there was enough people who who sided with thanos to begin with and stuff like this happens and it's like oh yeah man you know maybe he was kind of awesome but uh in a weird bad way it's bad you can't do that but still well, the, Car- yeah. carly i guess would have uh would have been a would have agreed with him you you would have had a, a lot you know germany had a lot of resources when they were liquidating a good chunk of the population and taking all their valuables so you know yeah no for sure i'm just saying that somebody can always view it as the right way to go right and in a lot of ways that's what she wanted it to return to the way it was pre-blip yeah uh, uh, so yeah anyway and, and then I also like I love the line when Sam is trying to get that line of credit from the bank and they're like you've got no job history you have no earnings history for five years and it's like well because he was you know like the blip counts for the bank mm-hmm. like you, you it's like he wasn't in the our realm he was snapped out of existence mm-hmm. he can't earn like you can't build so it's just it's all it was another thing to think of that it's like you can't you have to if you got blipped you have to come rebuild your credit which is crazy <laughs> that's such a cr- I would have never thought of that in a million years uh, and, and you know, like look there's also some racial undertones to it which is fine Strong. but I, I like that yeah. I mean obviously but I like the way that he pointed out like he said it he's like you've got no income history you've got five years of no steady income and I'm like well because he was blipped it's just hilarious it's it's I love little details like that it's so good because like I, I you know Far From Home Spider-Man Far From Home touched on some of the post blip universe and these kids who are now like younger than their younger siblings their younger siblings have grown five years and they were two years apart so now the younger siblings the older sibling sibling and the older siblings the younger sibling they they touched on some weird stuff like that, but um, it didn't get to this level of detail, so I, I appreciated that. Well, that and all the key characters in Spider-Man all got blipped and came back together to be the same class, so uh, that that was definitely much more papered over on Spider-Man than it was in a place like this one here. Uh, so then, let me see, what, what was I was, was going to say something? Well, actually, I mean, Fix has been real quiet. You got anything to contribute on this? No, just listen to y'all recap the, the show. Mm-hmm. Oh, but, you know, Bat Rock was in it too. We forgot to mention. Bat yes, Rock. Bat Rock was the guy who was doing the kidnapping. And it was a good, they, they came up with good, okay, there's two comp- uh, confrontations between Falcon and Batrock, this established Captain America villain. And both times they find ways of making that work because, you know, Captain America is a fucking super soldier, a badass, and he's, there's no way that you're going to have Falcon as a regular human being able to go toe-to-toe with Batrock. And it also goes back to my Batrock principle, where Batrock may not be one of the higher level, most highly regarded Captain America villains, but if you put Batrock against the Punisher, he's going to fuck the Punisher up because the Punisher is nowhere near at Captain America's level. And so it's, it's he doesn't get the respect he deserves because against almost anybody else, he would be a major fucking, you know, uh, oh, dominating force. But against Captain America, he's a jobber. Well, Falcon ain't Steve Rogers either. And so they found ways of making this work where in the first time he confronts him, it's aerial combat. Obviously, there's an advantage there for the Falcon. And then the second time they run into each other, they don't really interact that much. They don't have a protracted fight and uh, there isn't a, a decisive victor 
on either side of it. So, and again, the wings were used to great effect to help level the, the playing field somewhat, but at no point do they diminish Bad Rock or by extension Steve Rogers by suddenly having the Falcon go toe to toe with the sky. And I appreciated that. Yeah, I think the, the one thing about this series, I just, I kind of wish Bucky would have kicked a little more ass, but I guess it makes sense that, you know, when, when in uh, Civil War, when he was like having to test all those super soldiers, they kind of whipped his ass too. So it's like, okay, I guess, you know, if, if he's fighting against a pure super soldier, maybe, you know, I don't, I don't know what version of the serum he got exactly. with the robot arm. That And he also really relied heavily on, you know, like guns and explosives. Mm-hmm. So now that he's a good guy, he can't go around just capping motherfuckers left and right. So he's got to like kind of beat them into submission and stuff. So m- maybe he's not, m- maybe they actually did okay. I kind of kind of keep reminding myself that like, you know, I'd, you know, Bucky at, nor- at this point would normally like just pop a cap his ass uh, and can't do that. He's got to show some restraint now that he's a good guy. So Well, and that's one of the things that I like is that, you know, he got the broke ass uh, attempt at the super soldier serum and he was never supposed to be at Cap's level when him and Cap were fighting together as part of the Howling Commandos. He was not equal to Cap at all. And then, of course, as the cinematic universe progressed, Cap just got stronger and stronger. Uh, whereas in the first movie, you could still argue that he was probably still human strength. By the time you get to Civil War, it's, he's you know, or well, the Winter Soldier, where he's, you know, holding on to helicopters and preventing them from taking off. You know he's got to be at superhuman levels. Where Bucky got the 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 bullshit version, and that's one of the reasons why you didn't have all these German super soldiers to go after him. They didn't have Hydra super soldiers to go after him. Uh, but it also shows that he was valuable enough to be exploited as a Winter Soldier, even with the one arm missing for all those years because they didn't have another guy like him. But of course, over time, we find out that there are other guys like him. Um, most especially of importance is the revelation of Isaiah Bradley, uh, an African-American man who was experimented on after the time of Captain America. I think they allude to him having been involved with Korean War and having found himself in a similar circumstance as Captain America where he was part of a bunch of people that got experimented on all the other guys went nuts and died he was the one guy who was I don't, I don't want to say it's purity but he was the one guy who still stayed a good guy even after he had the serum and when a bunch of his buddies get captured by the enemy he goes in there he liberates them he brings them back and instead of cheering them on and turning him into a national hero like they did with Cap uh, they put him in prison and experimented on him for 30 years and he never got to see his wife again and all this other fucked up shit so uh, very much a lot of this show is about show Showing how the experience of one America is different from an experience of the other America. So, yeah, 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 go ahead. so when he got when he got the uh, the serum, was it before Cap or after Cap? So, well, see, you read the truth, right? Yeah, okay. truth. Yeah. It's so why don't you Cap. fill us in on that? I never actually read the truth. I've read, I read bits and pieces of the whole thing. What what is the basic story of that one? Um, it's the Tuskegee Tuskegee, Tuskegee it, uh, Airmen. The the Airmen. Tuskegee, yeah, no, not the Airmen, but the Tuskegee Experiment. The experiment. Yeah, basically, just they they use African American. Americans instead of Americans or white Americans to pro, you know try all this science shit out to see what are the effects the ill effects of them and you while they were developing truth, the super is, soldier serum before it got into Steve yeah, Rogers yeah. but I, if I remember correctly he, he slow it, it affected him mentally like he was progressing mentally but he still he was I think he was even close to like above cap level strength I would I'm trying to remember dude, it's been years since I read it I do remember there being something about how it, he it mentally it affected him to where he like was like you know Rocky Five, Rocky, basically, by the time it was done with. Yeah, him. well, no, I think he, he was becoming childlike. Mm. I think his his mentality was, pre, uh, was that uh, regressing? regressing backwards? Yeah. yeah. Um, and again, I'd have to reread this. I've, I've tried to find it in trade form, and I can never find it in trade form, and I don't want to whip out my copies, because I don't know where they're at. They're somewhere mm. in my boxes. But, yeah, basically, they experiment. So that's why when I saw it in the show, I'm like, so did they experiment before Cap? Which means that sweet little professor we saw in the first movie actually was doing this shit? Or was it after Cap, where they still had maybe some, some sand and they were trying to recreate it. Well, and I hate to break it to you, but I think the truth was something like 15 years ago now. And so the timeline has shifted enough to, no, more than that actually, because uh, they had his like grandson or whatever uh, be super patriot in the Young Avengers. And that character yeah. is present on this show as well. So they're no, no, kind no, of teasing him becoming patriot. I, I understand the... I, I understand the, the the storyline in the comics, but I'm right. saying in the show. Well, that's what I'm saying. Is the t- the, It's been like 20 years since they came out with the truth. The truth was already, in terms of time-wise, a little bit tricky to pull off then. So 20 years later, it doesn't make sense. So I, I think that they allude in the show, and I, it doesn't it doesn't work otherwise. I think that he was the victim of attempts to replicate the Super Soldier Serum after Cap in the cinematic universe. Okay. But yes, in the Marvel universe, he was before Captain America. Before, yeah, he was before Cap. I mean, the whole premise was that they wouldn't test these experimental uh, formulas on white people. So 
so they saw the the, the, uh, the black Americans as disposable and so there's this whole group of, uh, of soldiers that were you know obliterated by the super soldier serum with only one survivor mm -hmm. um, so that that was the premise in the comics yeah and so when I saw him in the show I was I was happy to, I was happy they brought that in because that's you know that's I think important to Cap I, I think to his to his uh, foundation of who he is um, and I like that they showed he did he still had strength you know he's lifting he heavy objects with you know with ease he's you know smashing shit so yeah. that's cool I like that I, I'll be honest with you I, I did not recognize Carl Lumley because of all the makeup and they, they beefed, beefed him up and stuff yeah. um, but what I did notice is the old age makeup wasn't great and then later on I found out that he was uh, you know Nantis and Martian Manhunter and such yeah, yeah. Uh, the other thing that got me is uh, they talked about eventually later on the, the story they talked about how they developed these this new super soldier formula and that it was apparently derived from blood and there was a, a story element in the Agent Carter series where Peggy Carter had a vial of Captain America's blood that she was trying to hide from people and so I got really excited for a minute it's like oh my god they're finally playing off that thing from Agent Carter and then it was explained that no 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 this is Isaiah Bradley's blood not Steve Rogers' blood and I was like ah so just I had to throw that out but I did like the new super soldiers because they didn't bulk up like Cap mm -hmm. they just were I guess more agile they could jump around and I, I don't I think thought, that they were necessarily be. any better than Cap aside from being less I don't think less... they're as strong as Cap I still think Cap was probably stronger than them and Isaiah was probably stronger than them mm -hmm. but they were I'd say Peter Parker strong maybe yeah maybe I less. think that's reasonable well, and, the, and the simple fact is there are more superhumanly strong people now so Cap would have been more impressive as like the only guy back in the 40s but at this point there are enough superhumanly strong people that being even remotely in Cap's range isn't that impressive and it, it's sure. Cap's fighting ability that kind of puts him over it's one of the things that made it work for me when the movies decided to give him full on superhuman strength which was a you know it, it was a kind of a sticking point for a long time because the whole point is he's supposed to be a human but once you've got all these fantastic beings around and they've got all these superhumanly strong people around it's like well yeah but he's also a badass fighter and he's smart and he's got strategy and so ultimately I think it showed it, it allowed him to do more and uh, still be competitive with all these other people but it was also interesting the dynamic switch with the John Walker Captain America because in the comics uh, the, the whole deal was that Cap's losing ground because you've got all these superhumanly powerful people and he's still peak human but only human and so he's questioning whether or not he can really keep up and be the sentinel of liberty you know under these circumstances in particular you had the power broker who was if I remember correctly introduced in the thing books that um, maybe John Byrne was still writing at the time or somebody else might have taken over by that point but he started I, popping I up I just remember him that name always popping up whenever you would have like the beetle or stilt man or some some character I think the hood at one time where you had some character who's looking for powers and you could be like a hood in the street robbing people or if you could get this guy's attention and have enough money you could get some kind of weird power or some kind of weird weapon to stand out that might have been something they did later on but my recollection is that it actually started out the thing books and what it was is you had an equivalent to the world wrestling federation but they were giving these guys super steroids to make them superhumanly strong so they'd be more impressive and, and basically you know outshine the wwf and so because these guys are superhumanly strong the thing was able to join these wrestling organizations and fight with these guys wrestle with these guys professionally um because they could somewhat match him in, in abilities and that's where d-man demolition man came from who was at one time a sidekick to captain america uh, that's where the the second miss marvel i think i think it was the second miss marvel um do you remember her name sharon something right i don't know the redhead this sounds lame <laughs> okay. I, I didn't know about all this stuff so yeah was so, the, the so that's where the, that, the power broker started all the, those thing comics and then Wait, was this in the 70s 80s yeah it was early 80s i would okay. say it early mid 80s very... and then you have john walker come along and he'd gotten the same treatment as those wrestlers had gotten but he's using it to be a big public figure and to basically be involved with vigilante justice and him and his buckies as they called them his basically the thugs that he ran with his broheim who were also jacked up by the power uh, broker they were doing like anti anti immigrant sentiments and stuff they were graffitiing and shit they were just they were bully boys they were you know like a national was front nuke kind part of, of that huh? uh, i don't think nuke was no because he had his other pills so okay because wait my question is was nuke part of the flag smashers not to my recollection not unless okay. like i don't know why i thought he was yeah nuke was kind of I mean, that was just a daredevil thing that i, I know that they came okay. up with some different nukes later on but it was contemporaneous because born again was like 86 or so and so yeah. same with the captain america stuff but the whole thing is you've got this guy who's m more right wing you know, like, like extreme right wing to, uh who pretends like he's more of a centrist but he's really kind of extremist and you know he's gotten himself popular by being super patriot and then the uh council decides that they want captain america to come back and start working for them there's a whole story where basically cap was able to get the 
the back pay for all the decades that he was on the ice. And so he took that money and he created this network of like basically a hotline for like, hey, do you Captain America give me a call? And he had these operatives who were helping him to get to the places where he needed to be. And I think as a result of that, they were able to find out his secret identity because it had apparently been buried in government paperwork for years and nobody knew. But after he started getting those payments, they figured out who he was and decided, well, we've been paying you. Now you need to come and do what we would tell you to do. And he said, I can't do that and still be Captain America. So that's why he had to surrender his shield and suit. And then John Walker was talked into becoming Cap. But one of the big uh, story elements of that is that John Walker being empowered by the power broker ha- can sue so much more physically than Captain America can do that it's like, am I keeping up with these guys? Is, is it worth it for me to continue to do this when there are people who are more capable than I am? But seeing that despite his physical power, John Walker was not mentally the person that you needed to be Captain America. You know, there's a situation where because his uh, uh, identity was public knowledge, a group called the uh, I think it's called the Watchdogs. Uh, they killed his parents and then he murders one of the, the pe- members of this group, this terrorist group. And uh-huh. later on, it turned out they were all working with the Red Skull anyway. They were all duped by the Red Skull. And uh, that led to both Cap finally confronting the U.S. agent and basically reclaiming his role as Captain America, but also them teaming up to go against the Red Skull. Since by that point, they, there was a mutual enemy that they both wanted to go after. And they kind of made their peace with each other. But th- the whole point of that run was John Walker showing that he wasn't the stuff to be Captain America. America. And so what's cool with this show is they flip it where Cap was so superhumanly strong in the movies and then here's this guy coming in trying to take his place who's no, who's just human and being just human he cannot live up to the weight of expectations of people's idea of who Cap was because obviously Cap made mistakes and he did things that were not necessarily to the greater good you know like you know saving Bucky no matter what was not to the greater good um, you know all that shit that went down in Sokovia maybe if he had his eye, eyes on the ball he could have prevented some of that shit happening. So Cap, Cap wasn't perfect, but people think of him as being perfect, and he couldn't live up to those expectations. But it was cool because I got sort of the same story that you had with Steve Rogers through John Walker, but they're flipping positions. So I, I thought that was a really nice touch there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I thought that um I, I really liked Johnny Walker's arc mm-hmm. in this. I, I like that, you know, I, like you said, they intentionally made him be like, would you call him a, a dweeb, or would you call him a, <laughs> uh, I, I don't, I don't know. remember, Doof, a Dilbert? Doofus. A Dilbert. They made him <laughs> look like a Dilbert. Well, I saw one hilarious. person that put like a, 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 a cob pipe in his mouth and turned him into Popeye. Popeye, yeah. Uh, but but I, I I like that. I liked all of this. I liked that, you know, they went out, they just found a war hero to make a new Captain America because, you know, America needs a Captain America. And he's even got his, his black sidekick. And it's just like, like they're trying to create a Captain America and Falcon, you know, but it's all U.S. government trying to fake it. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Like they're, they're just tr- like doing whatever they can and sending them on these little covert ops missions. And I loved, uh, you know, his Good Morning America interview out on the football field at his high school or whatever. And, well, and they're uh, playing and, the Star Spangled Man with the plan and he's high five in the, you know, the, the uh, musicians in the band and shit. Signing yeah, a and, figure. What was that? He was actually autographing. He autographed like a toy figure of him. But yeah, but wasn't he signing at Captain America? So I wonder. He probably was. I, I mean, he, he believed he was Cap. He told everybody he's Captain America. Yeah. And, and but I but I like how pretty early on they already kind of let you into the fact that this dude may not be fully stable. Yeah, or you know, or he's just obviously got a temper, right? And and you j- you know, because I think uh, uh, Battlestar tells him a couple times, like, dude, you got to stay cool, like you got to stay cool. Like, and I think in some of their, did they do some flashbacks at one point? And it seemed like he has he he was a little brutal in his flashbacks and stuff. And it's just I, I like that they were kind of dropping the hints that this dude he may have the credentials to be Captain America, but Steve Rogers was Captain America for it. It worked the one time because it was Steve. Like I like that. I like that. You know, I like that we're able to turn the page and move on from Steve Rogers, but at never point cheapening who Steve Rogers was. Mm-hmm. And even though Steve doesn't appear in this show, and this show is not all about Steve Rogers and Captain, you know, there's not a bunch of flashbacks to him. You know what I mean? There's no black and white flashbacks or anything like that. Well, I mean, a huge part of the show is his absence. And I'm so glad they didn't do any bullshit cameos in or something because it's all about these people trying to fill this void that's been left by him. Yeah, but I think they it's all done with the respect to the, all the other characters too. Right, They're not right. like, oh, I'm so shitty because I'm not Steve Rogers. Mm-hmm. I should wish I was Steve Rod- you know what I mean it's they don't do that which which I think a lot of shows would have done that you would have either shat on the characters in the show to prove uh, that Captain America was so great or you would have shit all over Captain America to build up your new versions 
of Captain America that are going to be sort of carrying on. And this show did a really good job of not doing either of those of these things. And, that, you know, th- they're not just sort of wrestling with the fact they lost a friend. They're sort of they, they understand that this dude meant something kind of to the planet. And there was this, there's this whole like, do, you know, what do you call it? Uh, um, Sam's point was that like, no, we need to sort of just let him be the icon that he used to be. And there shouldn't be a new Captain America. Mm-hmm. Right. But like out of respect for him, whereas the U.S. government took the opposite. It's like, no, we got to have we just have to. It's like a radio host. You keep the name the same, but you're, you're just changing the dude. And it's like, oh, this guy's been on the air for years. It's like, no, he's actually been like five different guys. Right. That, that's how they're taking it. Like, no, we, the name was more important than the guy. We got to kind of keep it going. Mm-hmm. But again, I never felt like this was like a, like a big Steve Rogers funeral show. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like at but no point. That one thing I did like, though, episode. is that uh, in game spent a good chunk of the last act uh, memorializing Tony Stark and telling us how awesome he was and how he's the guy who ultimately saves the day. And then you go into Far From Home with Spider-Man where they got the mural of him and everything else. And Iron Man got a lot of love between those two movies especially. And Cap's not dead. And Cap got a happy year ending, you know, because he got to live to see a bunch of stuff that, you know, he got to live out his golden years where Tony Stark only got to middle age. Um, But it, it was nice with the show by showing posters and showing murals and, and, and reminding people that, hey, Captain America was there too. Captain America did some great shit too. And to some degree, I felt like they overshadowed Cap's career by leaning so heavily into the death of Tony Stark. And I get it. And I had no problem with it while I was watching it. I didn't even realize that it was a thing for me until I was watching the show. But I love this whole show is about, well, also Cap did some shit too. And Cap battered too. So I, I appreciated it for that. While also it's not about Cap as much as it is about all these people figuring out what their lives are going to be in the absence of some of these bigger marquee heroes. Agreed. Um, okay, so do we want to, or where do we want to move now? We're going to Mad Rapport? Where are we going? Yeah, I mean, we were doing kind of a synopsis thing, but we also have the whole rolling commentary thing, so we're probably yeah. going to need to address Zemo now. Okay, well, can I talk about Isaiah Bradley real quick? Sure. So I, I, I like, so I didn't really know about Isaiah Bradley. That was right after I just got out of comic books and all that, uh, what was the name of that show? We were talking, the Truth or whatever mm-hmm. came out, um, or that comic came out. Uh, and I kind of like the way you were just describing it, that I guess Cap learns about this, the prior experiments before he got, you know, they got it right, whatever the WD, he, the WD-39 versus WD-40, that's the mm-hmm. one where they got it right or whatever. Uh, but I, I kind of think that, it, doesn't it play better to Sam Wilson? Like, it, it would make, uh, to me, this sounds like, like, Cap already had his, oh, the government's full of a bunch of bullshit, Hydra's been in government this whole time, I shouldn't trust any of these people, I need to follow my heart, like, my, the ideals of what I think America are, not actually the government, right? Like, I think Cap already had that art. He didn't need to find any of this stuff out. If he would have found this out, he would have been like, oh, you know, Fury didn't tell me that either. Like, he would have been like, duh. Uh, whereas, I don't think we ever went through that with Falcon, right? So, you know, uh, Sam Wilson was, is he's a veteran. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he 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 went through all this stuff. You know, he was the uh, emotional support, you know, uh, you know, he was doing the classes for, mm-hmm. for veterans, you know, who injured or, or had some sort of PTSD. I, I, you know, and he was still devoting himself to that. So, I, I think that, I just think felt like it worked so much better fitting it into this story that it's like this probably should have been how it originally should have been you know what i'm saying like uh, you know any sort of miniseries where cap found this out i just feel like especially in the comic books with all the stuff cap had been through he, uh, he was just like no duh i i, I don't know like I, i'm not saying that comic book wasn't any good i'm sure it was fantastic i mean the, the premise sounds really really good i just think that i, I love that they look took that story and fit it in it, it's like it was made for this show mm-hmm. yeah, to me it works so much better in the context of this show uh u.s agent i think almost works better in the context context no i, I absolutely agree he does work better in those, in those circumstances and i don't i don't know how they i don't know how they keep doing this but i'm like it's well, like they, they, they it's like they went back in time and they're able to take the lego blocks of marvel continuity and rearrange it and build something even better than was there before in some in some cases uh, and i don't know how they keep doing this stuff but well, like i didn't i didn't even know who i didn't even know who isaiah bradley was but i'm telling you they used it better in this show than however it was conceived in the in the comics winter soldier is a prime example of that i have not read captain America comic books since the Winter Soldier arc. And that's, again, I don't know, 20, 15 years ago or something like that. I started reading the Captain America comic monthly again after a, a, a gap. And I, I followed it up through till I think they did like, a, I don't know, 20 some odd issues as the initial arc of Winter Soldier. And I kept waiting for the twist to where he wasn't going to be Bucky Barnes because it was so central to the lore of Captain America that Bucky is his sidekick and dies. And, you know, it just reinforces his need to continue to be Captain America and the fact that they didn't do that I just couldn't forgive him for it because there's no way you're going to get me to believe it's 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 story breaking for me it's it's it, uh, 
concept breaking for me that Cap could go all those years and never know that the Winter Soldier was active. And even if you play with the sliding timelines, you still have to look to somebody like, you know, Franklin Richards or Peter Parker, where Cap's been active in the Marvel Universe for at least a dozen years. And he somehow never finds out about the Winter Soldier, despite his close ties to S.H.I.E.L.D. and Nick Fury. I just couldn't buy it. But by having the Winter Soldier be the second movie in the Captain America series and having Bucky be such a, a, a important character to the whole arc of Captain America within the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I don't have the problems with Winter Soldier in the movies that I have with Winter Soldier in the comic books because it just makes more sense. So it's very much like the same thing you're talking about. But what's also nice is that there's arguments about which of the Captain America movies is the best. And, and a lot of people, it comes down to perspective. We can all pretty much agree that the Captain America trilogy, not only is it a, an actual arc, which is something that I'm not sure is true of a lot of the Marvel Cinematic Universe uh, features, where you've got the three movies actually form one story, but also that's the possibly the best self-contained Cap movie because even people who aren't fans of superhero stuff can watch that one movie and it's a, a taut political thriller with superhero elements that stands on its own without having to see a whole bunch of other Marvel movie stuff, right? And so when they do this show, it's kind of the same situation where because it's it, it's taking that tone from Winter Soldier and that paranoia and you do have, you know, as you said, Sam Wilson is a true believer. You know, this guy gets to hang out with Captain America, which is like a dream come true to him. He gets to become the Falcon and he's a superhero and he's with the Avengers and he does all this cool shit. Um, and again, they show that in the first episode where he thinks he and his sister are going to walk into the bank and get the loan and no problems because I'm the Falcon. And, you know, that whole first episode is about you ain't getting the loan, you ain't keeping the shield, you're not going to be Captain America, deal with it, you know? So you're right. It, it's hitting him with that early on works so much better after Cap's off the stage than it than it does in a lot of the comic books because it's one of those things in the comic books where every few years Cap's taken off the stage and somebody replaces him. You know, Sam Wilson's had his turn, Bucky Barnes has had his turn, John Walker's had his turn. And what was so great is this, they just took all of those instances and put it all into one story where it would make the most sense. You know, this is the one time that Cap's gone, except this time he's gone forever. And now all you potential successors are all having to deal with each other in one story arc. And by the way, it's also going to be uh, paralleling the one of the best superhero movies of all time. So I think that was very smartly done. And like you said, they get the creators of the Marvel Cinematic Universe get to look at the entirety of Marvel comics and figure out what works best and when it would work best for the stories they're telling. And so where the comic creators are trapped by having the truth take place in this time period or, you know, uh, having Bucky turn up after 50, 60 years of, of Silver Age, you know, post-Silver Age stories of Captain America, they can fix those problems in the Marvel Cinematic Universe by starting from sort of kind of ground zero with Iron Man. Yeah, and but you know, you, it sounds easy, but, but yeah, there's just no way. Yeah. There's no way. This is this is this is like next level. Def now you're fitting it into the TV shows that follow up the movie. So now you're juggling movie continuity and still splicing in very cleverly comic book continuity yeah. at the exact right time. Like yeah, they, they could have blown the Isaiah how that shit worked out when they tried it. <laughs> ask yeah. Universal how that worked out. I mean, you you could argue Civil War in the movie was better than Civil War comic book. You can argue the Infinity Gauntlet story was done better in the movies than it was done in the comic books. I, I mean, it, it's just bizarre to me. I, I don't know how this keeps happening. It's very strange. Well, and part of um, it that helps is they clearly have respect for the comic books, which is not a thing that happened for the most part before this point. I mean, you can point to the Nolan Batman trilogy, but I don't think that that's about respect for the comic books. I think it's a respect for the concept and trying to do the type of mature storytelling that uh, put like blew up Batman in the 80s, but they're not necessarily adapting those stories, and they're kind of still doing their own thing. Marvel part of what made it work is they respected the continuity and took full advantage of the fact that hey these guys have laid out 80 fucking years of stories for us maybe we should take advantage of that instead of deciding that we know better than they do it, yeah exactly I, I, I don't it's Ke yeah it's Kevin Feige just, mm -hmm. no go, stick to the comic book just stick just read or, or it or stick to the kernel of the comic book that works stick to the kernel of the continuity that works but also adapt it for this uh, this milieu you know it's like they it, they know just how much they can deviate while still retaining the core that will make fans happy it's it's yeah, as you said, it's alchemy, and nobody else seems to be able to do anything like this. And it's, it may be down to Kevin Feige. So then let, let's get back to the the series real quick, because after he leaves Isaiah Bradley's house, uh, Winter Soldier gets arrested for his parole violation. But the cops come up and they're immediately harassing Anthony Mackie because he's the African American fellow. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've heard apparently like a lot of people have issues with that. But obviously, yeah, you know, fuck those people. Whatever. I, I thought that was th the show made some very bold decisions that I, that again we're on Disney Plus here uh, that I really appreciated and i think it's stuff they would have done in the movies too so because uh, they've, they've done some stuff like this in the movies too so i, I was i thought that was uh i mean i don't know if it was completely necessary but I, I appreciated stuff like that that they weren't beating you over the head with it but they were reminding you throughout this the 
good. Th- things are different for Sam. It's not just he's just not he's not just the other white uh, superhero who doesn't want to be Captain America and he's got this moral dilemma. There are other things at work here preventing him from being Captain America. Well, I, 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 I there had to be at least a little bit of a thrill though that to, to see a situation like that as the white guy who ends up getting arrested. There's got to be a little bit of fun to that. I gotta say, <laughs> you know, um, shit was I gonna say? I just forgot. I, I like that they make a point of letting you know that the Winter Soldier is invited to the barbecue. Uh, they do that over and over again throughout the show, so that's really cool. Uh, what was the thing I was going to say that fuck I completely lost my train of thought? I don't, I don't know. I give up. We're moving on. So anyway, uh, at that point, that's when Johnny Walker and uh, uh, Lamar Hoskins come, and they're like, "Hey, let's all work together and do this." And they're like, "Dude, get out of here!" <laughs> like, and I love, and it's you know, I love that like Bucky can't stand this dude because he's got the shield. Like he can't stand it, and and Sam just kind of has to keep like he's telling him no, but he's also trying to keep Winter Soldier in check. He's trying to keep uh, Bucky in check too, and I. I just I, I love the dynamic between any time Johnny Walker shows up on the screen and they're both just like rolling their eyes at this dude like get this clown out of here dude I loved it every time it just it well, cracked me I up. like the discomfort that he had Walker or like he knew they looked down on him like you I just sensed the tension from him like he knew he wasn't deserving of the shield yeah and and, and they, they let it build throughout the series it, it definitely yeah. started in the beginning like that, he's trying that to play it off heavy on him he yeah, doubted he, himself he saw the doubts in other people and I really did enjoy that like that's really to me what's a cool driving force for him to become what he becomes so at that point that's when they decided to just go uh or, or does does winter soldier he's the one who says we got to get zemo out is he the one that yeah. he yeah. goes you know what we got to have not just that he's the one who visits zemo and he's he doesn't come up with the plan but he does like a one thing that helps with the plan I think he, he feeds a note to one of the prisoners to set them off to set off basically the riot and then zemo takes it from there and again again one of the things i was super looking forward to on this show was that that we only got the one movie of Zemo and it was very much not a Zemo that I found to be recognizable from the comics all that much and so seeing that master manipulator and uh, I, I love that this show gave us an opportunity to see this other element of Captain America lore that didn't get as much attention as I wanted it to and they show him being really cool but also he's got these sort of nerdy qualities as well and these like kind of off center qualities and so to me it almost like informs my view of the comic book Zemo because there is this tendency to where all the villains can kind of be samey samey it's like there's only so many degrees of difference between the comic book Baron Zemo and the comic book Doctor Doom but when you get Daniel Brühl playing Zemo and having to come out of you know give you in a performance and not being some guy with like a Shakespearean you know delivery or something it, it informs who I who Zemo is for me in reading the comic books and it gives them more distinction it makes them more particular because I'm getting to see an actor portray those characters in a way that I wouldn't necessarily have thought of in my head you know yeah I, and, and I like that his arc and you know, th- when he finds out they've created more super soldiers, and I love that it's that he has to exterminate these super soldiers. Like, right. That's what that's he what has I, a hatred I, for them. Instead of it being the oh, I got to get some of the serum for myself. No, they stuck to what he was like in Civil War. He wants to exterminate all these super powered heroes that were responsible for destroying his, uh, you know, Sokovia. I mean, I like when he starts like smashing them when he when he finds them. You, you see it get in his hand. I was like, oh, he's gonna take it or he's gonna hide it and take it later. And he throws it on the ground and he just starts stomping on all of them in front of her and he's just wiping out her dreams yeah. of creating or, his army or, or when he meets the uh, Dr. Wilfred Nagel who was the one who read it and he caps this dude because he's like we can't have any he, he figured it out this guy's got to go and yeah. it's like dude I, I love they stuck to it uh, now wh- where it kind of goes a little sideways for me is that you know he was like a mercenary from Sokovia the poor country of Sokovia but he's out actually he's got a butler and like multiple houses and stuff like that that's where I was like okay well, I understand you got to kind of have you got to add the Zemo as aspect to it at some point but I mean he was obviously uh, I mean I guess they didn't really touch on it in Civil War so I, I, don't, just... I don't think they messed up that much because they, they establish in the new show Falcon Winter Soldier that he is from aristocracy but he's part of an aristocracy of a, of a fallen country you know a collapsed country and so him taking the money that he had taking the skills that he had becoming like this highly paid soldier of fortune kind of deal it, it, it gives him a little bit of a Destro quality where Destro also has the, the butler in Wintergreen um, so one thing with Baron Zemo is he kind of has the same deal as Doctor Doom, where he okay, was, thank you. That's what I thought. Yeah, he's born of aristocracy. Aristocracy. He believes that he's better than other people. He wants to elevate the Zemo name and be a contender. It, very much the same way as Doctor Doom. And as much as I love Baron Zemo, it's a it's a cliche motivation. And so giving him oh. that hatred of superheroes, which is definitely reflected in the way that both his father in the classic Avengers comic books and Zemo as the, the son is constantly going up against the Avengers. Well, why are they doing?
doing that. And, you know, part of the motivation was they're both scarred by their encounters with Captain America and shit. But it, it never necessarily made a lot of sense beyond the Avengers being in the way of Zemo's ruling the world, besides the other people who also want to rule the world. We're making it, no, these people are dangerous. These people have done me and my country harm. I, as a human being, have to do everything in my power to put these fuckers down. Uh, that is a motivation that actually works better to some degree than the comic books does. Now, let me ask you, did Zemo ever have any dealings with, like, Red Skull or any of them? Or Hydra? Well, I think... In the comic? The, uh, the original Zemo, Helmet Zemo, if I remember correctly, I think it's Heinrich is the son. You know, I always just say Zemo. But the elder Zemo it, it was definitely involved with the Nazis. Okay. I don't recall if he ever had direct uh, in, involvement with Red Skull specifically, though. And okay. I think that the junior Zemo actually has an adversarial relationship with, with uh, Red Skull. But part of the problem is that Mark Grunewald didn't have an interest in Baron Zemo. And so you, he, when he spent 12 years, 13 years telling all these stories involving the Red Skull, there was like one story arc that involved Zemo. So they never really involved each other, were involved each other that much. And Zemo got developed in other titles like Avengers and Thunderbolts. So I don't really think there's a lot of interaction between those two characters. But there there was a Zemo in the family that was involved with the Nazis. Oh, okay. So now we go to Mad Report? We go to Mad Report, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think that's good. All right. So now we're in Mad Report. Uh, so they're there trying to track down. Is that, are they trying to track down the power broker? Or are they still trying to find uh, Carly? I think what it is is that Zemo recognizes that because the power broker is pursuing Carly, that that is their best lead to also find her and hopefully right. find her before yeah, the power broker yeah, yeah, does. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. And I, I don't know about you guys. You, you see, Mad Report meant nothing to you, Matt, correct? Uh, I mean, I knew it was a place, mm -hmm. but it was more of an X place, and I don't do X places. Right. And then for you, Fix It, you, we talked about Madripoor in the Wolverine episode recently. Yeah, that was, yeah, I remember that's when Patch and Fix It were running around. Yeah, and well, of course, was anyway. it was in Madripoor that you had the classic issue with Cap, uh, 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 Wolverine, and Black Widow, too. Mm -hmm. So I, I love that they did that sort of high-tech, uh, Ridley Scott-looking kind of city. I, I think that worked well, and it was really distinctive. And it's funny to me because I wasn't a moron who's thinking, oh, hey, they're in Madripoor. This is definitely where they're going to introduce the X-Men. And thankfully, a lot of that stuff went out with WandaVision, where people had these ridiculous pie-in-the-sky notions. But the fact that Madripoor was never used in the um, the X-Men movies, you know, they never got around to that. And so I was still, I, I firmly believe that part of the reason why we're not seeing a lot of X stuff is because the stuff that got used in the movies, I think that there's producers who have their fingers in that pie. And I think that's going to be something that's going to keep the X-Men from being part of the, the cinematic universe for at least a little while longer. But Madripoor was free, and they were able to use it. And the fact that there is a Mad Report in a Captain America related show tells you that those that X shit is in the Marvel Cinematic Universe even if they're not going to be explored as fully as they perhaps would like to at this point or maybe they just haven't built up to it yet but we actually had a conversation a little while back about how they built up Madripoor so much as this super dangerous city the worst place in the world and uh, they kind of futz that up pretty badly it seemed like initially yeah they kind of waltzed in and waltzed out <laughs> it, it, they did that a few times this show I think I, I think you might have you might you and I might have had this conversation kind of off uh, off air or whatever but there's a few instances in this show the the helicopter chase scene in the in the first episode there's some like real like logic head scratchers where they're blowing doors out of airplanes and there's like zero decompression and it's like like every movie does the decompression thing why else would you blow the door off like <laughs> and, and like nothing happened like no nobody's hair even moves um and then what do you call it uh when, when they're chasing uh carly's group on the semi trucks and falcon winter soldiers sneak into the middle truck and it's like the <laughs> truck behind them is staring right at them like the driver's looking forward you, i think you can even see the driver as you're looking at sam and, and it's just like what like what this is some weird stuff and it was the same thing in when they're in madripoor where they talk about how hard it is to get to go see the power broker and they go up to see that one woman who who, uh, who like agrees to arrange a meeting or something and then they they shoot her with like a, like a sniper shoots her or whatever now it, it reminded me it was it the power Sharon broker's people or was it uh the flag smashers that did that yeah, power it people, right yeah i think so uh so and then it's like how are we gonna like because they had to go through all these different levels to get in to see her and then like we got to get out of here and then all of a sudden they're just like in a car driving out of the city and it's like oh that was easy like oh that was a piece of cake uh or no i think like don't they get like suddenly they're in an alleyway and it's like how'd you get out of the building and then sharon meets them and shoots a few dudes and takes them out in like a car whatever. and actually we haven't talked about sharon carter yet so uh obviously she was introduced in the winter soldier so you've got that continuity where she's back in the winter soldier and falcon series um we haven't seen her if i recall correctly since civil war where they just established the potential for a cap relationship and apparently they never brought that to fruition and Sharon as in the comic books just gets totally screwed because she doesn't get cap she loses 
her job in S.H.I.E.L.D. and eventually she becomes so demonized that she has to flee the United States and she's a wanted felon and that's how she ends up in Madripoor uh, you know being involved in all this sordid business she's in the high town she's in the nice part of town but she's still in this foreign country hiding out from the government so um, she's got a lot of misgivings there's a lot of anger and resentment that's displayed while she's talking to uh, uh, Bucky and Sam and you know there is some mention of, the, of uh, her potentially getting a pardon but her situation is fucked up and that, that reminds me a lot of the comic books because they did the whole thing like she was before my time like you, you know the story with Sharon Carter right in the comics yeah do you know what now that I don't know if I've ever I don't know how Sharon Carter got introduced now so, that we're mentioning it I think she goes back to Steve Englehart's run and she was involved with the, all the uh, Grandmaster stuff and everything so what happens with her is she's working undercover and Cap has shown video of her being burned to death you know but he's seeing it on video and takes that as, as proven fact and then for decades they don't do anything with Sharon Carter but then they bring her back at the beginning of the Mark Wade Ron Garney run the the uh, head of Heroes Return the first arc after Mark Runewald left that was extremely well regarded we're fans of it too and she's saying that yeah no I, I got left out in the cold and shield cut ties with me and I was again the same circumstance so she's super fucking bitter but also Red Skull in that story arc has the cosmic cube or for you cinematic people the Tesseract and he's basically got control over reality and so or has the potential for that so she's got to come out of the cold and team up with Captain America actually I, I, to stop that from happening so and then she becomes an ongoing character uh, throughout Mark Wade's run on the book uh, the two runs I should say and she's present up through it till at least the Ed Brubaker run um, she's involved in a major event that I don't want to spoil for people but um, she has sort of her own winter soldier issues that end up having to be dealt with too and so I like that they were able to reflect that in the show even though I still have a little bit of trouble with Emily Van Camp because even though she was on that revenge show and everything else I just don't feel like she has quite the edge that Sharon Carter should have um, to me Sharon Carter should probably be more like a Sarah Connor type and she still seems a little too soft for that but she gives us a little bit more edge in the TV show and I think that's the part of her that's disarming you though you do mm-hmm. see her as kind of like oh she's soft and then she's doing these fucking ninja moves and shit mm-hmm. like shooting people in the head she shot somebody in the head right oh yeah okay I was like I was like, okay, yeah she she was yeah, the closest like, to a John Wick in the show when she was active doing combat shot yeah well and I, I think it's uh, yeah I can't remember to say shit lost my train of thought damn it never mind continue continue what you're talking about sorry so she's the, she's the one who gets them to the guy who is, was creating the super soldier serum uh, for some reason randomly he's got a lab in tanker trunks uh, or like in tankers like shipping containers and of course the forces of Adrapur you know uh, descend upon them and Sharon single-handedly is spinning off these forces while uh, Zemo and the, 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 the other guys are trying to figure out what's going on and how to get to Carly and how to get to the power broker and then Zemo just up and caps the fucking dude and then they all have to fucking run the fuck out of there and then pretty quick uh, our guys are back in the United States because they've run out of leads right in that way or no no they're still in the are they, they're still in Europe aren't they or they're still on the, the another continent you're they're in Eurasia at least right mm-hmm. that, uh, yeah because they gotta be yeah. going to Sokovia and shit they gotta they, they, or not with, I don't know if it's Sokovia but they're they're in those countries where they're still pursuing the flag smashers they're just you know a little light on leads at that particular point in time yeah they, they hop around to like his different homes and then they're, they're to wherever Carly's group is because where, where he tries to he gets the he goes to the kids they're going around trying to like you know shake down all these people in this building to figure out who the flag smashers are none of them are talking because uh, one of Carly's like mentors passes away and they get word that that happened uh, and Zemo said you know knows that none of these people are going to rat her out so he goes to the kids to ask them when the funeral is or whatever uh, I think that was all of that episode mm-hmm. yeah and then being a person who's used to dealing with people with things like PTSD Sam wants to go in and talk to Carly alone but uh, being you know uh, cocksure and arrogant but also deeply insecure uh, John Walker can't handle that shit and so he ends up breaking uh, into the c- scenario just as Sam is starting to win Carly over and then everything goes to fucking hell yeah I I, I love that scene I love because he was like I'll give you 10 minutes and, and Sam's like actually making some you know headway in a conversation with her and actually you know kind of I, I can't exactly remember what which take he took to start kind of convincing her that maybe what she was doing was wrong and here I, comes I old so Johnny Walker wrong it's more that he could relate to where she was coming from he recognized that her motivations were correct and that things did need to be done for her people um, and you know could lay on the African American experience like look man I, I know what this, this kind of shit's like to 
be a part of a country that doesn't love you, respect you, support you. Um, but we got to figure out a different way of doing this. And also the fact is, you know, I'm here with you right now. I'm this close. So I'm not the only one who's this close. You know, we got to try to figure something out that's going to work for us. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But it was more like once you start turning to like killing people, you're a full on terrorist. Like that ain't going to go. You're, you're not like you're not quite past the point of no return yet. And I understand what you're doing, but you just can't you can't take that jump. And then she, you know, Johnny Walker comes in, blows the whole stupid thing up. And uh, she th- throughout the course of the series continues her path. Yeah. And we well, literally do see her taking more and more ruthless uh, tactics. So Sam had called it. But the fact even, is, even to the and even her own people are like, whoa, like, uh, we're going to blow it up like we're blowing stuff up now. And she's yeah. like, yeah, that's what we're, we're going to do. We're people like, inside. Uh, we know they're inside. Yes. And, and then when does uh, when, when do the door Melange pop up? Was that right before they went to uh, figure yeah, out? It, who... it was right after that, because as because of John Walker blowing everything up and screwing up that scenario, that was their last lead to keep up with the Flag Smashers. They're in the wind at that point because they don't know you know what direction they're going to turn at that there. And so they go back to Zemo's hotel. And that's when the Dora Milaje or, or actually the Dora Milaje talk to them before they go to the funeral of uh, Donya or whatever her name was, the mentor figure, and says, you've got X number of hours. We want the guy who killed our King T'Chaka. And we're really fucking pissed at you for letting him loose in the first place. And then the Dora Milaje show up and fuck them all up. And I don't know about you guys, but especially once they started going after John Walker, I literally cheered. I was like, fuck yeah. Uh, they they were so fucking badass. Yeah, when he like puts his hand on one of them or whatever, and it was like, ooh. I th- I th- doesn't doesn't Bucky even say like he shouldn't have done that or some shit like mm-hmm. that and they yeah they just absolutely destroy that dude they kicked all their ass that was a great fight scene mm-hmm. I, I love when the they shield got the spear into the hoops of the, the shield so that Walker couldn't even get his fucking arm up anymore you know it's like and they, they just compl- or and then they literally disarm the Winter Soldier um, just all the fucking lethal moves nothing but fatalities potentially you know uh, there there's they could have killed everybody in that room if they wanted to I did like the way that they had that secret way of deactivating the Winter Soldier, though. And I know a lot of people got pissed off about that. We're calling it ableist and shit. And it's like, whatever your ethics are in that scenario, you you know enough about the Wakandans to know that's how they're going to operate. So that don't be naive. You know, you can yeah. you can judge them if you feel the need to. But the simple fact is, they gave this guy a multi million, if not billion dollar piece of equipment. Well, that, they know that how to do it. What fucking uh, not adamantium, um, vibranium, vibranium. So it's supposed to be like. So basically the same as the shield. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they, that's one of those things that gets hinky with the comics because the whole point of the creation of Adamantium was to try to get something that worked the way that the shield worked and the shield was created by accident and it's a combination of steel and vibranium. So, um, so they're, they, they, yeah, they, they're OG on the uh, vibranium. Yeah. But no, yeah, that was such bullshit and they were just like, oh, so the Wakandans didn't trust him? I thought the whole point of uh, Black Panther number one's ending was to show that the Wakandans weren't going to be like that anymore and they were going to stop not trusting people and i'm just like no i think you're like, they're not giving away free billion dollar vibranium arms to former mercenaries and they're going to just be cool with that because of the end of black panther one like let's not be silly <laughs> i mean they, it's their technology so they know how to undo their technology that, they, you know, i'm sure they also want to make sure it's never used against them also yeah, yeah exactly and, and not only that but the fact is wakanda doesn't owe this motherfucker anything you know ao the is wolf. the one huh the white wolf yeah the white wolf ao was the one who helped to deprogram him finally definitively you know Ao was probably the one who helped to train him in using his new arm you know uh, she he owes everything to her especially once he's on his own um, you know she creates the white wolf essentially by by helping to repair his fractured psyche and again they give him the replacement arm so who the fuck is he to, to be able to say anything about that you know I'm, I'm sorry he, he doesn't he's dealing with Wakandans and he's not a perfect individual either why would he expect this absolute all altruism from the you know they've done so much for him that he doesn't necessarily deserve that how are you going to like judge them for having his fail safe for a guy who has occasionally gone off the nut, his nut and killed a bunch of people yeah well I, I, don't, I think in the show he was like oh you damn Wakandans I don't think he really was surprised by it it was this weird like faux Twitter uproar about yeah. it or whatever and I was like this is stupid you people are dumb the, 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 the social justice warriors need to have their own winter soldier so they can get get in line with, with, with the way the world actually works like if you thought anything in this show cheapened black panther one you're 
fucking out of your gourd, dude. <laughs> like you're in another planet. I don't know what 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 are you watching anyway? So okay, uh, let me see. Is that when do we get to? Well, it's kind okay, of where uh, everything falls apart because they've lost Zemo, they've lost their leads. Um, you know, uh, John Walker is is all fucked up over realizing that he's just not up to this job. And um, part of Zemo escaping, uh, prior to Zemo escaping, is he manages to get a hold of the reserves that Carly had of Super Soldier Serum, destroy almost all of the samples. The only one remaining being one that gets uh, snatched by John Walker and eventually used by him. So, at what point does are we? Is that the fight where uh, Battlestar dies, or is that the next one? Well, the next time that they run into Carly, that is the one where he's accidentally killed. Yeah. And again, one of the things that's interesting about that too is Battlestar is supposed to be his his backup, and he gets uh, a, 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 a twist tied almost immediately. And it's just this incredible effort for him to get his knife out and get himself freed. And then he finally joins the fray, and he's immediately killed because he's way out of his depth. They both are. Yeah, and I, and I, uh, you know, as much as they try to like semi hype Johnny Walker through this, he does just kind of get his ass kicked routinely. That that truck, uh, the t- truck top scene where they're running on top of the semi trucks, he gets his ass kicked there. Uh, he gets his ass kicked by the door melage. He gets his ass kicked by uh, everybody. They all they all just whip him. And I think that is what feeds into his frustration that these people are all just other levels. And it's, it's, he's never failed like this before. And he's doing all this. He's supposed to be Captain America. He's convinced himself, I'm Captain America. I shouldn't be getting my ass kicked by all these people. So that's why he starts becoming more and more mentally unstable. It's like he's unshaved. We're not sure he's sleeping anymore. Mm-hmm. Like This dude, is he's having a complete mental breakdown. And then he runs into this vial of the super soldier serum and uh, and there was that really good scene where he and uh hoskins are talking about you know that you know if you had a chance to take the super soldier serum would you take it you know because it's supposed to enhance all your best qualities or whatever mm-hmm. or you make you more who you already are yeah and and, and and having been in battle with this guy and probably saved and having been saved by him these guys are brothers so he's maybe blind to this deterioration that you're talking about yeah so then it culminates is they get in this scrap on flag smashers and carly punches uh Lamar, he flies across the room, hits a pillar, and is dead. You know, blood's coming out of his mouth or whatever. Dude's gone, which drives, you know, uh, and I, so at that point, has he already taken the super soldier? Yeah, yeah. 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 He had, right? Wait. Because that's when he, they, he ran uh, into that when he was like kicking doors zip open and like being this total huge freaking badass, and he still couldn't save his buddy. His buddy still died. I should say, they had been through everything together when he had been normal, and now he's taken the serum, and the first time he takes the serum, he fails and his friend dies. Mm-hmm. That just, again, leads to this complete mental breakdown, and he has like the basically he's having roid rage right uh until he tracks down one of the flag smashers outside the building the dude falls down this was not Car- carly was the one that killed uh hoskins not this guy but he's just so enraged pull you know the dude's mask comes off everybody's got their phones out and he just starts chopping this dude with the shield blood all over it going everywhere and everybody's like jaws hitting the floor aghast at it they're all shocked because captain america's being live streamed uh just butchering this guy with a shield and again it's the brilliance of the mcu is obviously that's a visual reference to the decapitation of uh, Baron Blood, Baron Blood yeah. but it's completely recontextualized and as much as there was a, a badass moment for Steve Rogers, Steve Rogers isn't in the MCU anymore. You know, we talked about this recently, how cool it would be if they would do a flashback movie where, you know, Cap's in World War II again fighting the va- vampires, but that's not going to happen. And instead you have this powerful moment using this imagery, but recontextualized in a way that to some degree works even better than the original comic books. But if, even if it, you don't agree with that, it still works definitively because it lets you know just how dangerous John Walker is, how unworthy he is of, of the Super Soldier Serum, and how this guy is the imminent threat more so even than the Flag Smashers. Yeah, and I, I just thought the whole imagery there was just like, I mean, I I, I had my mouth open watching that. Like, I, I was like, oh my God, they're going to freaking do this. Everybody's got their phones out. He's going to murk this guy right here. Uh, and you're going to have this, you're going to have Captain America covered in this dude's blood. Uh, I, I thought it was, and I think they ended the episode there too. And I was like, what is going on in this show, dude? Like this show. And uh, anyway, I remember Mr. Fixit texting us with fuck with like 27 U's. Yeah. Yeah. That might've been me. Was that me? I think it was Fixit. Mr. Fixit, are you still there? Yeah. Yeah, I'm here. What are your thoughts? On the shield? On that sequence. I mean, it was cool that they included it because that's like one of my favorite scenes in the comic drawn by uh, John Byrne, right? Yep. Yeah. That was John Byrne. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was brutal. I mean, and they played it nicely where your imagination played it up more than probably it was because I I assumed he was hitting him like a Above the above the shoulder blades, and he literally cut his head and like cut him in half. And you just see all these people recording him, and he's just huffing and puffing. Um, no, it was brutal. I was really surprised they did that. That caught me off guard. I think they gave it enough ambiguity to where you could think it maybe went through the chest, or maybe.
maybe he chopped off the head. Uh, oh, I'm, they I'm they left it open to interpretation. Cool. And then you see the blood like just on the end of the shield. I was just like, fuck. And see, what's great about that too is it's taking full exam- uh, advantage of the medium because that would have got given them an R rating in the theaters. Uh, that was going to be a bridge too far. And as you said, they did it as tastefully as you can decapitate somebody while um, they literally played that for horror. They, they, that is probably one of the single most horrifying moments in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You remember Scott Derrickson got fired from Doctor or quit whatever happened with Doctor Strange because he wanted to have a more true horror experience in the that sequel and he mm-hmm. just couldn't see eye to eye with Marvel. So the fact that they were willing to, to literally the music, the reactions, everything about that sequence is played as a horror beat from a horror movie up to and including the blood. And if I recall correctly, the episode afterwards, they're dropping a lot of uh, choice language as well. Uh, that's something... They said shit MP- quite a bit. Yes, yes. So the MPAA would not have let that fly as a PG-13. So you're really taking full advantage of the medium. They're, they're on TV, but they're doing what you can do on TV that you couldn't do in movies, you know, and, and wouldn't necessarily be appropriate in a movie either because it's one thing when you're trapped in a theater with a kid in silence watching that happen where in the last moments of a TV show, you can then look over at your kid in your home and say, okay, so here's what's wrong with this scenario. <laughs> yeah. Well, usually in a movie too, it's like alien blood or some shit like that. Right. Where this was like, you saw blood on the end of that shield and no, he stands up and he's just like crazed. Yeah. Well, and also he's got that fucking twisted look on his face too. It's like he's, he's gone. Satisfaction. He's beat. Yeah. He's bent, yeah. I should say. And then of course, in the next episode, that's when we have the big confrontation between Falcon, Winter Soldier and the current Captain America. Great fight scene. I do I like the way great. Falcon uses his uh, jet pack to do those crazy jumps. Kind of yeah. Like a, I think Falcon they do. Fu. Yeah. Well, that's a good way to put it. I, I think they, uh, they do a great job really developing the Falcon character in this whole show, not just from like an emotional standpoint, but powers too. I think oh, they, yeah. you know, he does like super punches. Fal- I guess it'd be a Falcon punch uh, where, where he hits the <laughs> boosters and he's punching people. Uh, you know what I'm saying? And don't Google that. Um, <laughs> so, but no, I, I think they, they, they got really creative with it. And I really, I appreciated that. They, I mean, they, they really spent this whole series developing uh, the Falcon character. You know, I mean, they just didn't have time in the, in the MCU movies. Uh, so I, I'm glad they paid attention to those details well, and went like- out of their way to, to give him his own fighting style. Yeah. And although he doesn't have superpowers, he uses the little tweaks in the suit to maybe give him a like, make him near superhuman. You know, he's kind of bulletproof because he can use the wings to shield the himself. Shield. And then yeah. he uses them like almost like anchors sometimes where you can throw them into the ground and pull back on stuff. And I, I like where it's almost like a Dr. Octopus thing where he can almost use them like powered gloves or something. You know, he can use them as an extension of himself. Yeah. I thought that was really neat. So yeah, I thought that whole, I thought that fight scene was fantastic. And I love that. It, <laughs> I love that it's just like, bro, give us the shield back. Like, no, 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 no. Now you fucked up. Now we want the shield back. Like before we were asking for it, now we're going to take it, dude. And then don't they like snap his arm? Yeah. I, I think it doesn't Sam when he hits his, his boosters or whatever, trying to pull the shield off, whatever, it breaks his arm. Something like that. Because I remember the, they show a scene and his arm is just like limp. And I was like, oh shit. Yeah. And then it's in a sling. It's in a sling. Yeah. Next to, after yeah. He, when he gets dishonorably discharged or other than. But okay. At that time, we've already agreed that he's on the serum, though. Oh, yes. No, no. Yes. So he's healing he, up like super fast then. Yeah. He had already taken the serum. I mean, that's why that's the only way he could hold his own against. I mean, Falcon probably could have kicked his ass before, but he's holding his own against Bucky and Falcon. True. I, I will say that Paquita was with me when I was watching that sequence and she had like an oh shit when they broke his arm. Uh, I don't think anybody saw that one coming. Oh yeah, no, I think I said oh shit. I think I said the same thing when they broke his arm. I, I didn't see that coming. So yeah, but I, I just, I love the, that the bridge of those two episodes. The end of episode four and the beginning of episode five is just like freaking hold on, dude. It's it's going like 100%, you know what I'm saying? Full bore. Yeah, and aside from being disappointed with the way Madripoor worked out, I, I was on board with the series, but I was also missing the human elements. I really loved the, the real life shit that was in the first episode and then they got really into the, all the spy shit and we lost that and one of the things I dug about the fifth episode was they got back to that in a really big way um, dealing with the consequences of all this stuff happening dealing with the morality of the flag smashers um, you know John Walker having to deal with the consequences of his actions beheading that member of the, the terrorist group um, you've got Falcon wrestling with the fact that somebody's going to have to be Captain America and it might ought to be him but I remember there was this meme that came out like I think after the first episode where I, I think it's Steve Rogers and Tony Stark and a third party are all in heaven and Steve tells Tony about how he gave the shield to uh, uh, Sam and Tony's like so did you give him a security detail you know do you, get, you set up at the headquarters and stuff he's like no I just gave him a shield it's like do you not love this guy you're not friends with this guy you're gonna get this guy killed you're not doing you just gave him the fucking shield and that's it and of course the show has kind of demonstrated that where uh, you know what happened with Isaiah Bradley and the, the fact that Sam doesn't even think that he has any business being Captain America and, and, and just hands the shield off to the government thinking that that's all there's going to be to it. 
to it. But now he's recognizing that somebody's going to fill that Captain America void and he's got to question whether or not it can be him, whether or not he wants to invite that shit into his life, given that, you know, he was just fighting this terrorist who was threatening his sister and nephews and stuff. He's got a really heavy weight on his shoulders and the episode takes its time to really show, you know, what does all this shit mean to Sam? What does this shit mean to Bucky? Um, you know, their, their, their families and stuff. You know, it's it, they, they really dove deep and I, I appreciated that they they didn't just leave us hanging with shit and they didn't just go for the spectacle, that they were willing to spend an episode just really thinking about the philosoph- philosophical and um, uh, moral and um, just like practical, you know, measures that go into place with, with all the th- stuff these people are doing. Yeah, and I, I love the uh, Isaiah Bradley scene in that episode mm-hmm. where, where he goes, to him and he's like, he's like a black man cannot be Captain America and shouldn't be Captain America. And like, no self-respecting black man would be. It, it, right, and I was like, damn, dude, this show is, they're going there. <laughs> they're going there all the way, dude. And and But look, uh, from his perspective, uh, he shouldn't feel any other way, mm-hmm. right? After what he went through, he shouldn't, it shouldn't be any other way, you know what I'm saying? And it's just, uh, yeah, anyway. What's funny about that is that's not a dissimilar speech from Pa Kent and Clark talking about the busload of kids, except that in the case of Pa Kent, that shit comes out of nowhere and never gets explained, and it only really makes sense if you go uh, behind the scenes, you get into Zack Snyder's, um, you know, objectivist views and shit. In the context of the story, though, that shit never gets explained. It's just assumed that that's the correct, you know, response to that situation. Where in this show, they take the time to tell you why would Isaiah Bradley feel this way? What is the validity of that statement? Where is he coming from in making that statement? And frankly, you know, I'm, I'm sure at least half the audience is side with Isaiah Bradley. He's like, yeah, you're right. You know, what the fuck are you doing? I think you could still make arguments against Sam Wilson taking on this mantle and surrendering his own identity of, of the Falcon to become Captain America. There's a lot of debate to be had there, and I can definitely see people taking sides on the issue. It's not a situation where everybody's just going, what the fuck was that? Yeah, and, and I, I I don't know. I just feel like, you know, in the comics so often, they, they just give the mantle to these people and they as they vanish for a while. And I, I just, I really liked this show. It, it really wrestled with the fact whether or not this should even be done. Like, mm-hmm. should we even be doing this? You know, and, and I just don't think, did they ever go there in, in, in the comic books? It's more just like, hey, you're Captain America now. Okay, cool. Like, I, I don't, I mean, I could be wrong, but I just don't remember it being this, uh, and look, maybe it's the times too. I don't know, that, that it, it rings a little more uh, true than it would have reading it on a comic book back in, you know, the, the 90s or the 80s or whatever. But uh, um, I, I, I just, I really like that there's this, you know, and you got people on both sides who, who have very valid points as to why this should even be a discussion. Do you know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? I don't know. I'm talking. But, uh, I, thought I, heard, I, I heard Fix It winding up and I wanted to give him the, the floor. No, no, I was just agreeing with you. Okay. I, I think that, again, I've never been a big fan of the Falcon character in the comics. And so I don't go out of my way to read Falcon comics. And the fact is, uh, Fal- Sam Wilson, is, as I've mentioned, he secedes Captain America for a period of time uh, during a run that I believe was mostly written by Rick Remender. Which I told you was good. I read it. That was uh, That's what I thought you were going to about to, to comment to that. So why don't you elaborate? Well, no, I mean, I, it's definitely in your wheelhouse. It's uh, I remember reading and thinking, oh, this is so Frank's uh, soapbox. <laughs> so when I told you about it, you're like, nope. I was like, I was kind of surprised, but I was like, okay. Um, but it's, you know, the struggles of a black man taking on the show. I mean, it was, it's some of the beats from the show were definitely in that book. Okay, I remember. good. Okay, good. I, I, so I, I was not aware of that arc and I, so I apologize. That, that's awesome. Yeah. So that's if why when was, I was, if it was any good, uh, I thought it was good. I liked it. Um, Ryan Daly was because he's struggling because there's people angry that he's carrying the shield that he shouldn't carry the shield and he's trying to find his place as Captain America but not I, I have to go back because again I read them as they came out it was one of the few times I was reading the trades as they were coming out um, but it felt very similar to what I saw even the uniform I mean where he when you know he's got the wings he's got the shield and he has that look and I remember reading it and I was like man this is pretty good I, I enjoyed it and I remember thinking you need to read this Frank and you were just like nah, nah, nah. I was like okay well never mind so I was, Wait, I was talking about the suit we, we get the you know they, they tease us a lot of people were pissed off about it but they tease you at the end of the episode with him opening the suitcase that was delivered by uh, Bucky uh, at, at, the, at his request of the Wakandans to provide Falcon with a new suit because of, during the battle with John Walker his Falcon uniform was destroyed the Falcon uniform was ultimately given over to uh, Jaime Torres uh, which well the wings uh, right no the wings were destroyed the wings were destroyed but the remains yeah. of that suit were given over to Jaime Torres which even alludes, the wings, hmm? didn't even give him the wings he gave him everything yeah but he gave him the broke ass shit but since yeah. Jaime Torres has a role in the comic books that may or may not be elaborated upon in this show, it's interesting they made a point of him having the remains of the Falcon suit. Because um, yeah, I think in, in the, if I remember in the comics, 
uh, Jaime actually has the powers of a falcon, or like he's genetically altered what a falcon. Yeah, yeah, okay, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he replaces the falcon when Sam Wilson becomes Captain America. Yeah, like he, they, I think they're kidnapped by um, what is the genes- geneticist and the the not the the not Arnim one. Zola. I think so. Ah, oh, it's, it's been so long since I read it, but I think that's where he meets Jaime. And Jaime has like wings and shit, and like big eyes like a falcon, and I think clawed feet and shit. Um, and he's kind of like a sidekick. Yeah, which is why it was a little disappointing because I like that character, but he basically appears in two of the episodes. It seems like you know he's he's in and out so quick that we don't really get a chance to spend any time with him. Yeah, they they really they really set up that first episode that like they're all like they're the OG Bucky and Falcon. Like that was his original Bucky, and then like the guy's just completely gone, and it's like oh well oh, that guy. And then he pops up, and you're like oh I remember that guy from the first episode. Uh, but you know he finally does open up the suitcase at the end of episode five, and then at six, very early on, you have the shield flying, and it was funny because of the way it's lit. At first, it looks like it's an all red shield, and then until it finally hits the light that you see that it is Captain America's regular shield because uh, they were kind of playing around with um, the uh, teaser in the previous episode where Johnny Walker's also making his own shield after being stripped of the shield and the armor and everything else and so it smashes through the window you see it's the, the classic cap shield and then through the window you see the Falcon who's not the Falcon anymore he's now Captain America he's got the red white and blue color scheme and it's literally one of the most uh, comic accurate movie costumes I've ever seen so I was yeah. just shocked at how close it was to the comics oh yeah absolutely it looked great. Are we, are we going to talk about the Contessa? Mm-hmm. She's introduced in five, right? Yeah. So you go on, go into that one, I think. So it, it's after uh, Johnny Walker gets uh, other than honorably discharged, and he's all pissed off walking out. And then uh, Elaine shows up, <laughs> and she's talking. She's all just bebopping and scatting all over the place, <laughs> telling joke after joke. And uh, what do you call it? It's basically trying to recruit Johnny Walker, and just says, you know what? They don't want you, but you still got a place, and blah, blah, blah. Right? Yeah, no, you're you're going to be one of the hottest tickets in town. Uh, and uh, I'm going to give you my card. Uh, when I call, you better answer. Is she, is, doesn't she pop up in other books too, like X-Men books and stuff? Uh, well, okay. uh, Nick Fury. Yeah. yeah right? She got introduced during Jim Steranko's run on uh, okay. Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. If you remember the infamous uh, sequence where Nick Fury puts his gun in a holster. Yeah. And it's, uh, uh, yeah that, it's that's, a that's yeah. She's the holster. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Jesus and, Christ. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, you know, she continues to be in the comic book. She's in Nick Fury vs. S.H.I.E.L.D. She's in the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. series that got launched in the early 90s. And she's bopped around through the Marvel Universe for years. She's never had, like, a major, major role. You know, I, I mean, they did some developments in recent years that I was unaware of. Um, and I'm not sure how much of that's going to be reflected in the show, so I don't want to go into that too much. Go to any of the comic book news sites and they'll spoil all that shit for you. But on the one hand, it's not the most comic accurate because Valentina was always supposed to be, like, this exotic like Italian kind of chick and Julia Louise Dreyfus is in no way exotic but she's also Julia Louise Dreyfus so I'm, I'm here for it and she's basically doing a variation on her character from Veep from what I can tell um, it's a lot of fun and a, a, a show that can be as dour as Falcon and the Winter Soldier can use somebody like her and my understanding too is she was actually supposed to be introduced in the Black Widow movie but the time Lion got all fucked up and so instead she's introduced here but we're going to see her in a larger role in that movie apparently oh cool was the was the Contessa in the Hasselhoff? Yes. Uh, yes. Lisa she, Renna okay. played her in the Hasselhoff movie. Okay. I was like, I thought for sure she, I, I had seen her somewhere else outside of the comics. But, you know, that's what it was. Well, and she's got the Pepe Le Pew uh, streak through her hair, the white streak through her hair, and it never gets translated into film, unfortunately. Well, isn't it blue? Doesn't she have blue hair in this one? Does she? Yeah. I thought Julie Lee Drivers had a blue streak. I did not notice that. Okay. I'll, I'll love to look in sometime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm very certain. I'm kind of certain. Now you're making me doubt myself <laughs> son of a bitch um well you, you i assume you were watching it on your big projection you know wall projection so you probably got to see some of the nuances that i missed on my relatively oh, small television you flatter <laughs> i was <laughs> get out of here uh, okay so we're still on five right we're no we pretty much transitioned to six we just uh, dove back in for contessa okay yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah, yeah yeah that's right that's back in five and at this point uh bucky's handed zemo over to the wakandans too right that's all that's all that yes and, that, and was the end of, that might have been a four. put bucky on the raft, um, which I'm not, I don't know why the Wakandans would put him on the raft, but you know, it's, it's a, it's a solid prison. Uh, well, Cap like and the, the Avengers have already broken out of it. But, to it though. Huh? I like the fact that they were like the raft. I was like, okay, that's kind of cool. Well, I guess it's better than some random German prison, but it's still not as good as we're just going to keep him on Wakanda because he's not getting the fuck out of Wakanda. But for some reason they put him on the raft. I don't know why that was. Unless the raft was Wakanda in the movies. I don't know anything about that. Yeah. I think maybe they just had some leftover CGI and <laughs> right. maybe had the set, the set was still built. So they just right. Used it. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that doesn't make sense. Obviously, they would just keep him in Wakanda. Why would they? 
I mean, that was the whole thing is that Johnny Walker wanted to take him back into custody. And they're like, no, you guys fucked up. We're keeping him <laughs> and it, they just it, give him back. To it, it, it's funny because back in the day, Greg, uh, Glenn Larson would be recycling uh, blaster props from Battlestar Galactica to Buck Rogers. And now we're like, well, we have the CGI elements from Civil War that we can use, you know. <laughs> It's, it's still the same kind of bullshit. Okay, so we're... Uh, okay, we did the Falcons uniform unveiling. Looks freaking dope. Um, oh, Sharon we'll Carter. Say- oh, they're going to go blow up this New York thing. There's, so there's going to be a vote, right? Mm-hmm. That's going to solidify these, what, the camps or whatever, full of people or whatever. And so there's a big vote. And so the Flag Smashers decide they're coming to New York and they're going to fuck this vote up. Since all these very important people are going to be in one spot at one time. But we also know that um, Sharon Carter has called called in Batrock, who she hired to steal that soldier in the first episode and is now sending him, I believe they explicitly say that he's going to kill the Falcon before they know that he's going to be Captain America. Uh, and that's done in the fifth episode, so we know that Batrock's in the mix going into the sixth one. Yeah, and that's where it kind of teases it. Because it doesn't, uh, what do you call it? Uh, is the fifth episode where Agent Carter, or Sharon says on the, the phone that get my man out of Algiers or whatever? Doesn't she even say that? Yeah. I thought they, they, yeah, she, no, they that, basically tell you in the fifth episode. The actual telephone conversation between Sharon Carter and Batrock occurs in the fifth episode. Okay, and that's when it's like, okay, Sharon Carter was the power broker. Although, I mean, you kind of... Well, you didn't know that. I I didn't know that until they called her that. And I was like, oh, shit. I didn't didn't catch it. I I had my theories, because she had like... She was a fucking big shot in Madripoor. They were talking about the power brokers, the big shot in Madripoor. And then she was like, I don't even want to go back to the United States, because shit's so good over here. And it's like, oh, it's because you're the fucking power broker. (laughs) And then when she called in the hit on the fucking Falcon in the fifth episode, I'm like, oh, she's a power broker. And then in the sixth episode, she was like, I'm the power broker. I'm like, yeah, yeah, duh. <laughs> it's like, I knew it was four weeks ago. What are you talking about? Well, the thing is, by the time you go into the sixth episode, it has to be a character that's already been introduced. And yeah. uh, there were a few people that were thinking that maybe uh, the Contessa was the power broker as well. But really? huh? yeah, there were yeah. people who thought that. Uh, one of the big theories was why would the power broker take the group to the base where she has a scientist who could make the super soldier formula and then that guy gets killed? Why would she do that? You know, and I've had to think about this a little bit, no prize in a bit. My feeling is that the reason why the people in Madripoor stop chasing after our guys is because the power broker shows up to save them. And likewise, I think that she called in only the lamest guys in Madripoor to siege the fucking uh, storage containers, the, you know, guys she knew that she could take because she's the whole time she's angling for the pardon because she wants to be able to get back to the States. So she's using these guys to get the pardon and she's not necessarily expecting that Zemo's going to go and fucking cap her guy because nobody expected that, you know. So she might have, uh, I don't think it's stupid on her part, but she may have gambled and lost on that. But I'm also suspecting that um, maybe they couldn't make any more of the serum anyway and so he wasn't valuable to her anymore. So they might have been worth the risking him and unfortunately ultimately losing him for, from her perspective if it got her the pardon she was angling for. I, I think saying that he couldn't make more super soldier serum is kind of no prizing it. I think well, it, it was all based on the blood. Gave- so they would have to be able to get more blood from uh, Bradley and Bradley's in hiding. Presumably they don't know where he's at. They I think they acquired the blood from the government not from the actual subject who is believed dead by most authorities so they may have just exhausted the samples they had and needed the blood to in order to replicate yeah so otherwise I, I why would you just I think you're more, more right yeah. I think they were that she was she just took a gamble crapped out mm-hmm. but the the positive was that if she gets the pardon then she can get back into the government into a government role and then she can just sell government secrets which is the payoff at the end of episode six so I, I think by the end of it I think at the time some of that stuff didn't make sense like I was saying in Madripoor they just waltzed out it's like oh well, it's because she was a power broker and then it's uh, you know what? Uh, how does uh, why is she helping Bucky and Falcon? Even though she, oh, I don't want to pardon. Well, yeah, you actually kind of do, and it's because in the end she'll make way more money selling government secrets and technology than she would have. Well, and she misses her family, people. and she misses being in the states. And Madripoor is not necessarily the best place in the world to have to be, and people are gunning for you all the time and shit. You know, so I, it makes sense. The the motivation makes sense to me. Yeah, and but but let's also not like bullshit. Like the power broker was the main villain of the show. They they just sort of mentioned the power broker and over and over and over again. But Carly's the main villain of the show. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Like, I, actually, a lot of people were saying that the main villain was uh, John Walker. And yeah, I, I would agree with that more. Okay, well, I would take that. I'm just saying, at the bottom of the list, the power broker. That was just the person Carly stole vials from. Right. Uh, to me, I thought it was like a nice little side question, but it was never, you know, who, does it really matter who the power broker was? It really doesn't. Unless it turned out freaking uh, Bucky was the power broker the whole time. and he'd, <laughs> I mean, then that would have been, I guess, bigger. But uh, I, it was the fact that Sharon turned out to be a power broker. I wasn't like, ooh. 
got him. That's so crazy. It was just like I, the power broker doesn't matter for this whole show. So I don't care. And I'm glad they didn't spend too much time on it. Well, and I think you can get a lot more interesting stories out of Sharon being of very questionable um, moral alignment as opposed to her to a degree, playing the role of love interest and sidekick to Cap for years and years in the comic books. If, if you're not going to do anything else with Steve Rogers and you want to do some more stuff with Sharon Carter, it just makes sense to employ her in that fashion. Yeah, I mean, otherwise the, the character has got no use. Mm-hmm. What are you going to do around, sit, sit around with uh, Sam and be like, hey, remember that time when I was pretending to be Cap's neighbor? And, you know, it's like, okay, right. like, where do we go? From? There, there is no point here. So if you're going to choose to have the character back in the show, yeah, make her uh, somebody with uh, questionable morals. I think that's fine. And so the Flag Smashers are in the building and they're trying to, in you know, stop the government, uh, whatever the government, because it's, it's very vague, because you would think there'd have to be some sort of a UN thing. But then they've got the senator who's working, you know, who, who discharges John Walker is also voting on the refugees and like the the command of what how government works is a little fuzzy in this particular segment. Uh, ultimately, their goal was to keep everybody in the building, and apparently, I think they were going to kill them all and to prevent the vote from happening. But the heroes were able to get the the um, people out of the building, and then they're in different groups, and so uh, they're trying to save various people under various circumstances, and we get to see the new updated Red Wing shooting lasers and shit, which was fucking cool. And, you know, pursuing helicopters and, and basically addressing these people. And then eventually at one point, uh, John Walker shows back up. They've already established that he's going to be the U.S. agent, I think. No, not yet, but it's coming. So, we'll, spoiler, yeah. he's going to be established as the U.S. agent. He's basically going to wear the same suit he was as Captain America, but all in black instead. And so he's... I do like, I, I do like the fact that he has a forty five on it on his holster, too. Oh, I didn't yeah. notice that. Yeah, yeah, he had a gun. Okay. Yeah, I, I just, I, I like that because the first Captain America movie, he had the shield and the gun. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it made sense because he's in a war. He's not just going to run in with a shield. Or U.S. agent almost feels more like a black ops cap. Mm-hmm. Like, he's going to go and do the dirty work that Cap would find questionable. Because I love, well, we'll get to that part in a minute when she talks to him. Yeah. And also, when Bucky was Captain America, he also had a sidearm. Um, so you're never, I don't think, going to see Bucky as Cap in the cinematic universe. So no. they might as well take that element and give it to U.S. Agent because it really makes sense for him. I'm actually surprised in the comics U.S. Agent didn't have a gun for so long. I think he eventually does get a gun. But for years and years, he just ran around with his version of the shield instead. Well, but, I love the fact, too, on his shield, he put his medals. Mm-hmm. Where he's well, not just that. I think he also put put his friends uh, like one of his friends medals or something on there too yeah. as a reminder in yeah. his shield like he made it out of like fucking car parts and shit or like <laughs> yeah. fucking he's iron manning the shit out of the shield in his fucking shed he's fabricating uh, yeah he made whatever, it from dude. a box of it was like a giant hubcap <laughs> I wouldn't get behind it during gunfire right well but they do have that really great scene where he actually shows up to, to meet his friend's family and tell him a variation of what happens and you could argue that he's trying to put himself into a better light and that he's being duplicitous but I you could also make the argument that he's he's telling them that he got the one responsible so that they don't have to agonize over that going forward because this is before they've tracked down Carly so just the fact that they, they took the time to have that scene and and show his family and sh- and show their loss and their relationship to him uh, the fact that it would have been really easy to just have him be like the you know a racist or something it's like no he, he has a black wife he has a black friend it's just that he's got his other issues that disqualify him from being Captain America. I, I like that they had that sequence and made him a, a more complicated character. But as you say, he's got the the metal welded up into this inside of his shield as a reminder, and he uses that to help him power through when he's getting ganged up on by the Flag Smashers and kick ass. But an important part is that there is the inference that he's coming in here to chop off some more heads. And then at one point, he has to help save a group of the diplomats from going over the, the a ledge in a uh, armored truck. And so he's showing that he's recognizing that he had gone too far and that he's going to try to be more the hero that he was supposed to be in the first place. Um, so it gives him a redemption arc, essentially. But I kind of like him being the dark cat. And that's that's an issue that I think a lot of people had, is if you're going to the show seeing him as the villain and a representation of this like entitlement and the arrogance of the U.S. and all this other shit, for him to, you know, no, I'm here to help too, I think a lot of people were disappointed by that uh, uh, face turn. Yeah, because once you have him, I mean, you have the building blocks for the Dark Avengers, pretty much. Yeah, but come on. I mean, the... the the dude, uh, nah, I I would not like that at all. I like that he redeemed himself 
little bit. Look, the government screwed him over too. He fucked up one time. This dude has been a war hero his entire life. He fucked up. I mean, it was a pretty big fuck up <laughs> chopping the dude's dome off or whatever. It's a big one. But you're now he's other than honorably discharged and they strip him like he was on Good Morning America. Nope, dude, we're taking the shield away. We're taking the costume away. You're you are now nobody. But that's you what are. I like is he his dissolution his dissolution of America where it's not what he thought it is. Yeah, didn't like, they? It's controlled did, did by I other imagine, people. Did I imagine they even talked about like he was not going to get benefits anymore? Or yeah, something yeah. Like that? Oh or no, they, yeah, they took everything away and he fucking loses his shit there. Yeah. yeah so off. so I look the fact that I, he helped those people because he wanted to help them, not because the government told him to go help him. I was perfectly fine with that, dude. I mean, I like let those people crash to their deaths. Like he's not a like he's not a freaking super villain. U.S. agent's a shithead and he's too unhinged. Well, to where see, the I would I, I would want head. him as a true villain, but he needs to be in that gray area. Uh, and I, I think he's not the Punisher, think he's gonna, but he ain't exactly Cap either. Yeah, but like, I think he's gonna rough let, up. He's gonna rough you up when he's taking you in. If you let the truck fall, you're the Punisher. Yes, that, and he's not the Punisher. So no. I, I think no. that would have been just been a little too. That would have been a little too much in, in my opinion. I don't want him that far either. I don't want him as a Punisher, but I want him. I, I like the fact that he's disenfranchised. Like I like that. I like that he's he doesn't feel like he's part of the system anymore. So he's gonna work outside the system. Kind of an A team type thing. A, a, a he's, gonna, he's gonna drive around in a black van and shit with B.A. Barack with with, uh, with Val with Julia Louis Dreyfus face and uh, yeah B.A. Barakas. And... <laughs> it would but be I, kind I, of interesting I, that's, though. That's, that's like U.S. agent I like. But we're talking if about. We're gonna talk about U.S. agent. I would probably go with front, what Frank says because Frank read all that shit. Where I just know him as like you know from the scourge scor- scourge run right. That's when he popped up. He was uh, could, around that same time. I think he actually was just a little bit after the scourge. Uh, okay. Okay. story had resolved but since they seeded it over a long period of time there may have been some super patriot stuff in the midst of that but my recollection is it's more like literally like right afterwards like the next extended story arc was setting up super patriot because i mean we already got the, the uh, super patriot armor from the iron man movie you got uh u.s agent you need just a few more and you got dark avengers and and, kind of- i hadn't thought about that but because a lot of people were talking about well they're going to do thunderbolts but i like the idea of what you know kind of the same scenario it's not just war Captain America is what if you have warring Avengers and who's going to be the Avengers team going for it now that might be too yeah. much of a retread but um, uh, it's an interesting idea and I, I you know you always want to see the two super teams fight it out so I'm, I'm intrigued yeah. by that because Thunderbolts I mean that that was a cool reveal in the books it turns out they're all villains and they're just playing the system but the Dark Avengers were the actual government <laughs> like they worked for the government the government hired villains to take on these you know hero- heroic roles and well, they, they weren't exactly I mean you got like they're feeding fucking scrolls to the fucking venom and shit and you know fucking norman osborne is going insane in the suit hearing voices and shit and they got you know fucking what was it his name uh, uh radio radioactive man and shit mm-hmm. and songbird and like all these villains I, I don't know i would like to see it go that way the, my thing is that we've got sword set up in wandavision it bothers me a lot that you know why would you have shield by another name you know what's the point it it, it kind of renders moot uh the first winter soldier movie if you're just gonna have shield show up and and, you know, essentially the same thing that S.H.I.E.L.D. was doing before they collapsed it. But if you have S.W.O.R.D. and you have Hammer and you have, say, the Contessa taking the place of Norman Osborn and putting together, like you said, the Dark Avengers. And so you yeah. have these competing intelligence agencies with their competing super teams. Plus, you've got the whole Secret Invasion thing that they're, I think, building towards. I think Secret Invasion is going to be to the really television. What's that? I think that would be really interesting. Yeah, I, I think Secret Invasion is going to be to the television shows what oh, Net- Defenders was to Netflix or what Infinity War was to the, the cinematic universe. You know, I, I think they're going to be building to something. And I assume that that's one of the reasons why you've got her. I mean, obviously she's not going to stop the U.S. agent. So what are you going to build to? Something like Dark Adventures potentially. Yeah. Because again, be, there, we're in this process of replacing all the blonde haired white dudes that were the Avengers with a whole bunch of people of color. And so if you've got uh, Contessa putting together a more traditional looking Avengers uh, that maybe resonates with the public, you, you can you know, do the meta commentary on are we going to accept these people of color replacing all of the traditional Marvel heroes of the previous 10 years there's you, there's a lot to play with there I think I mean yeah you'd have like what she, you'd have uh, Buck, uh, you'd have the new Captain America and he's mm-hmm. Captain America yep Sam you'd Wilson. have Winter Soldier you would also have uh, War Machine War Machine Let's see who else I mean I'm sure Thor would come back uh, see who's still from the original um, I mean the new Black Panther well actually I think that one of the purposes of sending Thor off in outer space is again sort like what they did with the Hulk, take them off the board. He's oh, off in space with the Guardians of the Galaxy, so he's not, you know, obviously if Thor's on a team, that's the team that's going to be the favorite to win. But True. if you are got two more grounded teams that are with more equal powers levels, then you've got a fight going. I, I like that, that what you're alluding to, where you have, you know, one, two, two different teams being built
built up. One's a little darker than the other, and you know, in terms of like, you know, there's you know, Dark Avengers versus the Avengers. It'd be kind of interesting. Well, and also with the the paranoia that Secret Invasion would instill. Oh yeah, it wouldn't necessarily even be about a competition. It could be literally not knowing who what side anybody is on. It'd be great if like it turns out all the Netflix Marvel characters were all fucking scrolls. <laughs> Like they kill them all, they're all turn out to be all scrolls. That Daredevil's a scroll, and that fucking Punisher's a scroll. That would be great. Or you're like gonna piss off the rabbit fans of the Netflix shows. One of the two. Yeah, well, that's fine. You know, Probably both. You know, or you, you know what you do? You bring in even the X Men from the Fox series, and you kill them off, and they're like, oh, guess what? They were all scrolls too. <laughs> like everything else but us are scrolls. Uh, we, so we should probably talk about the resolution of the the show. Um, ultimately, they're able to capture all the members of the Flag Smashers and save all the people involved with the UN or whatever they are but um, there's some argument about what to do uh, going forward and so we have a classic moment of Captain America speechifying to the authorities in front of the media telling them that look you know oh oh, I forgot to there is a final confrontation with Sharon Carter and Sharon Carter is about to get blackmailed by Batrock after uh, Carly reveals that she's the power broker so she's able to kill both Batrock and Carly and get to tell her side of the story classic and so part of the reason why you've got Captain America speechifying is that this woman had reasonable expectations of, of having a governance from her government and uh, you know there's an argument about hey I'm you know they're, they're trying to say that he's naive and he doesn't know what you're talking about it like hey I'm a black man wearing the stars and stripes I know what I'm talking about and this is a discussion you guys need to have because if you guys do this vote you're validating her terrorism and creating another generation of terrorism to follow in her wake are we, are we talking about this I thought you were about to yeah. continue and you just stopped I thought you were still talking no, I mean, uh, I, 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 it was a speech. I mean, I like that they blew up the flag smasher. You, you tell us what happened there. That's I think that's worth bringing up too. That that kind of caught me off guard. Where because they have don't they have a saying like one people one world or something mm-hmm. like that? Yeah, one of the people that's putting them in the paddy wagon at the end. It's a, it's an African American cop who who says you know world one world whatever it is, letting you know that there is a person in a position I hear, I, say, I hear Hydra. You know, cut one head, two will grow. Yeah. So they all have this fucking little thing. So anyway, he says that, and they all that one that one uh, the long haired flag smasher kind of grins a little bit like, oh, we're gonna get away with this, and the van starts. And it just explodes. And next thing you know, you see Zemo laying in the raft reading a book, and he's listening to radio where they're talking about how four flag smashers were blown up in a in a transport van, and it's his is his uh, butler who did it, which was uh, slightly hilarious, not necessarily for the reason they expected. Because yeah. I, I see the butler guy, and what I keep remembering is like the butler from Tomb Raider, and like he just seems like this doddering old man to some degree, and then to have him be the one who kills all the flag smashers, amusing, you know, like oh my god, really they did that? So I, I thought it was pretty. I just, figured, I just, I figured, you know, that means like everything around Zemo is not what it seems. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, so I, I thought that was kind of cool where Zemo got all of them. He wanted them all dead, uh, and they're dead. So I was like, cool. And then, you know, Sam gives his speech, and they announce him as no. He, somebody goes, look, it's the Falcon. He's like, no, that's Captain America. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. You know, and uh, you want to lead us into when he talks to uh, Isaiah or uh, Isaiah? I mean, it just, I, I'm gonna talk about. I guess the speech they can I guess they kind of had to do a speech. I thought the speech was good. Um, but I, I mean, there's just like no way they can do this and not be a little hokey right yeah i mean it's just i mean it's just not possible it's gonna be anytime a hero is talking to reporters and there's a camera on him and, and you know and he's trash talking the senator who just happened to be there and the woman who, who he had like land the helicopter is just there and they keep cutting to her and it's like wasn't she landing a helicopter somewhere you know uh yeah yeah i at that point i'm like okay i know this was you know it's always the penultimate episode is the big episode and then the last episode is they're kind of wrapping stuff up i kind of saw that speech as sort of the wrapping it up kind of a deal even though the the falcon uh the, or the new Captain America uniform was unveiled in this one and stuff like that. I, so it was fine, but uh, it was kind of just was what it was. I, I actually thought, like you just alluded to, Mr. Fix, I thought his conversation with uh, Az- Isaiah wrapped it up a little better. Yeah. I, I was glad he went back and, and visited him. Yeah. So here's where I'm at. They spent a chunk of the fifth episode, you know, with Sam processing everything and figure out what he's going to do. And by the end of the episode, we all know he's going to take on the role of Captain America, despite the, the warnings he's received and the headaches that he knows is going to come from this. And one of the, my favorite sequences from that episode, uh, and there's a lot of great stuff in that episode. It's, it's probably the best episode of the series, is him training with the shield. Like, they'd shown that he'd tried training with the shield in the past, but now he's, like, really doing it, where it's just, like, full-on. It's like, they should have had, like, a, 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 a hair metal band playing over this, because it's a full-on 80s workout montage of him working out to be Captain America. And as long as you don't think about the fact that it was probably a matter of days, if not hours, that he had before he had to deal with the flag 
Flag Smashers. It seems a lot cooler. But I liked him figuring out new ways of handling the shield and taking advantage of his Falcon acrobatics and, and three-dimensional, you know, awareness as he's flying through space a lot of the time. I thought they did a great job of setting up his determination to become the best Captain America he's capable of being. But then you get to that speech and it's like, why is anybody listening to this fucking dude? Because he's been Captain America for about five minutes. You know, even his fans are like, look, it's the Black Falcon, you know? It's not just a matter of it not being the living legend of World War II or, or the billionaire philanthropist, you know, laying down the law for some government agent. If it had been T'Challa, you know, the king of the Wakanda laying down the law like that, I can believe they would have just shut the fuck up because they'd know who he was. Sam Wilson ain't shit. And so it, it makes no sense to me that they, he, these senators would be cowed by this dude under the circumstance, especially the senator guy who's wanting to argue with him. And then, you know, he shuts that down and he gets the speech of fine. And as you said, it is corny, but another problem is when Anthony Mackie was shutting the fuck up and just, you know, doing the, the, the terminated, determined look and throwing the shield, I, I could, you know, I, I was like, okay, this guy can be Captain America. This guy can, he may not be my Captain America, but he can be somebody's Captain America. But then when he starts talking and he's still doing that kind of put on, I'm a Falcon voice while trying to be Captain America, it's just like, it was very cringy. And there's a lot of, there's been a lot made of the fact that most of this TV series uh, on Rotten Tomatoes has gotten like 80s and 90s. And then all of a sudden on the last episode, it plummets to 57. But I think that if you watch the penultimate episode, there's so much good shit in there and you'd have to be a complete moron not to realize that they're building up to Sam Wilson becoming the Falcon. And that was a highly rated episode. I think one of the reasons why the, the, it plummeted was because of like that scene in particular, but also the fact that as we've talked about, they set up John Walker for a final confrontation and then they're like, well, no, no, no. He's going to be kind of sort of a good guy. And then uh, we've already know from the penultimate episode that uh, Sharon's the power broker. And so her final confrontation with Batrock and Carly is pretty anticlimactic. And yeah. he really thinks of her as being the main villain anyway. And she dies in a way that where they don't... I thought it was a great Im- visual for the Falcon to lift up her body and drop it off like he's an angel. That worked really well. Yeah, that looked really cool. But she doesn't have a, a great resolution to her life. It's like it's a, her death is about making Fal- sorry Captain America look cool and not necessarily about reckoning with the fact that she's kind of right the whole time, even though she does some stuff that's wrong. But she is in the right. It's just that she doesn't have the charisma and, and the 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 verve of a Eric Killmonger. But she's much more the right than he was, and he was kind of right too in a lot of the stuff he was saying. So she doesn't have a great ending. They just kill a Batrock as like an afterthought. You got Sharon Carter. She's a power broker, and nobody even knows it yet. There's a real sense of a lack of finality. There's a, there's a, it's a very anticlimactic conclusion, and there's issues with you know things like okay, I want this guy to be Captain America. I'm prepared to let this guy be the Captain America for the people who want him to be Captain America. And then it's like, oh, by the way, we're going to have him be the Captain America in the fourth movie instead of doing another TV series where I think that this show worked really well as a TV series or, or a mini series. I don't know if a two hour blockbuster movie is the right venue for these characters and the scenarios that they've set up in this show. I think they need that space to tell the kind of story they told here. And I'm not sure it's going to work for movies. So I do think the racism played a part in it getting as low as 57%. That's really fucking low especially for Rotten Tomatoes television reviews because uh, TV gets a real pass on Rotten Tomatoes in a way that movies don't. But I do think that at least part of that uh, is down to them really not sticking the landing on the final episode. Uh, especially in regards to having some cool like, oh wow, yeah, cheering moment because all the cooler moments had already happened in the previous episodes for the most part. Yeah, and uh, like like I said, I, I think the last episode was probably the worst. Eh, I mean, I think episode three was not great. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, it was I thought it was fine I but I don't really know obviously they were setting him up to be Captain America so this was going to happen so I, I guess we all should have braced ourselves a little bit before time or that we were going to have to hear Anthony Mackie say I'm Captain America and it'd be like oh man that still didn't sound right <laughs> you know like it doesn't sound <laughs> and, and right. it's not about Sam Wilson to some degree it's about Anthony Mackie you know <laughs> yeah kind of although I did think he was way better in this show than I I was real pessimistic because mm-hmm. you know he, he just doesn't get a lot of, he doesn't have a lot of range in these Marvel movies, but I thought he was really good in the show. I, I think he's really good as Sam Wilson. I think he's terrific. Uh, and I thought he was really good as the Falcon too. In, in most of these sequences, until that last sequence. But even when he was Captain America slash Falcon, 
destroying all those helicopters and stuff. That stuff was all like really good where mm-hmm. he's using um what do you call it uh, red wing in different ways mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Like I thought that was all like really good and they were getting creative with the shield and that's I, I like all that stuff. That was all good. But it's still just it's going to come down to them saying that he's Captain America and then I just it's it's just something doesn't it's not right. I don't know. Something's not right about it. I don't know. Like I, I don't know if they I, but I don't know what the the resolution is. But one thing I do agree with you on is that I was I was waiting for the okay what's we're going to call like Captain America and the Winter Soldier is going to be season two. Instead, they said he's going to be Captain America and Captain America 4. And I'm like, I'm with you. I'm just like, mm, I'm not really sure. I, I don't know if that's going to work. I think maybe we at least need another season to kind of stew on that. Uh, I, I think they're kind of setting up to fail a little bit because if you have another Captain America movie and it doesn't do a B, then they're going to blame that on Anthony Mackie, you know? Um, I, I, I think that he, the TV show is the lane and this is a huge budget TV show and it's got some really excellent action sequences. Uh, you know, maybe let, let it be a TV show for a little bit longer. I have to say too, there were a lot of guys like Snyder stands who are making runs at this show. And for this show to deal as heavily as it does from a black experience written by a black screenwriter, uh, Malcolm Spellman, uh, I think that was a really bad move on their part. And also there was, uh, you know, obviously there, you don't have like the, the style, the, the amount of style as you would with a snack. Zack Snyder. But a lot of people pointed out that the director, Kerry Skogland, had some really excellent visuals on this show. And I think some of the lighting choices and, you know, like some of the shots where they're on the water on the boat and shit, it's a really good looking show. It's just not hyper stylized the way Snyder is. But I don't think that Snyder fans are doing themselves a, a service by t- comparing these two projects to one another. You know, it's very apples and oranges. And I, I don't want to disparage one and, and build up another one. But I think that Falcon and the Winter Soldier got a lot of stuff really, really right. And I think that it fulfilled fills the promise of the Disney Plus Marvel Studios television series. So let's keep doing that since that's working and maybe not try to, to do a whole different thing, you know, but you know, we'll see how it works. Maybe I'll eat my, my eat these words later on. I mean, I, I just thought that, uh, like, I thought all of the performances were, were really good. I, I mean, like, I wasn't cringing when anybody came. Even when George St. Pierre comes on his bat rock, I, it's fine. Um, but I, I thought that the chemistry between Sebastian Stan and Anthony Mackie's legit. I mean, those two guys are, it, it feels like a buddy action movie when those two guys are on the the scene i thought their conflicts were great i love the winter soldiers therapy arc and him having to have the the 12 step program list where he's having to make amends and he just couldn't do it to the asian guy mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying and i love i, I do on, think i like the too date. they made he sure the there is the daughter you you've got the the series bookended by the the uh, the two asian characters and at this moment in time i i think that, that that was intentional and wise and i really liked that you had this arc of what what was happening to these people because of the actions of the Winter Soldier. I thought that was really well done. But I loved when he went on the date with the guy's uh, like granddaughter or whatever mm-hmm. and she was asking him like, like you know, how old are you? And he's like, like 106 or whatever. Mm-hmm. She's like, ha ha ha, all laughing. Or then w- when he tells, uh, you know, uh, what was it? What, what was the, the album that uh, uh, Sam told Steve he needed to write? Trouble Man. Trouble Man, Marvin right? He's like, did mm-hmm. you, Marvin Gaye. He's like, did you listen to the Trouble Man soundtrack? And he's like, yeah, it wasn't for me. It's just, he, just a different dude. He's just a, he is stuck in the 40s or the 30s and you can tell, you know, Steve was like, oh, I want to learn. I went in and, and it's just this. I, I love they made him different. I love that even he was like, "Did you do, listen to the soundtrack, man? You listen to Trouble Man?" And he's just like, "Nah, yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't for me." Well, but likewise, I, you've I, got I, Zemo I, doing that hypercritical breakdown of how great it is, and then he's dancing at the club in Madripoor. I loved how not not only did I, I enjoy those little quirks that they gave him, but I loved watching audiences respond to that. I loved that people were embracing Zemo uh, again, one of my favorite Marvel villains, and, and probably my favorite Captain America villain, I, even though none of that was from the comics I, I, I love that those personality quirks endeared him to people and he endeared, endeared him to me as well oh yeah no I, I dug Zemo big time plus again you're sympathetic it's like yeah. he's right about a lot of this shit well and, and, uh, and, and I think the overarching theme between uh, Bucky and Sam was the, you know, the line you mentioned earlier where it was like you you have to be Captain America and it's like because if he was wrong about you then he was wrong about me dude I was that like made the whole series for me I'm like what, what a great perspective to take on these two characters and how just screwed up Buck, you know, because I mean, everybody gets, you know, they make the joke, you know, in, in Endgame where he's like, Bucky's alive. And he like lets him go because he's so like, oh, Bucky, I got to st- 
stop whatever I'm doing because Bucky's there. Um, but that's kind of how it went in these shows that like everybody was like, dude, even, you know, Tony was like, that's it. We're done with Bucky now. OK, the dude killed my parents. All right. Like how, how many how many uh, chances do we give this guy? And Steve was like, no, like, I don't care. He's my friend. The dude got brainwashed. I believe he's still the good dude that stuck up for me in the alleyways back in the 30s and 40s. Right. And and I like that. I don't know. I just felt the show had a real, real good heart to it that uh, it probably didn't really have any business having. But uh, I don't know. All these this, all this MCU stuff continues to kind of amaze me the way they, they do it. I, I just think that there was just the show was well casted. I love the story. Did it kind of end on a sort of a meh note? Yeah, OK, maybe um, it didn't but, stick. The, it didn't stick the landing, but it got pretty close. Yeah, I, I think it got I think it got really close. And, and if you look at epi- if you look at episode five and just call that the landing, I think it stuck it. And then six was just sort of wrapping up some loose ends we knew they had to take care of. Well, kind of uh, like with WandaVision, where they recognized they needed to put those first two episodes together uh, because standing on its own, it would have been taken too long to tell whatever story they were trying to tell with that. So they recognized they needed to do that. I think maybe they would have benefited from having a, a two part finale. I, I think it would have been much better received if they'd gone that route because it, it did feel like a coda, like a, you know, a leftover portion as opposed to the finale as, as a result of how they broke it up. Uh, you know, that's a good point. I think if five and six would have been watched back to back, it probably would have been a more enjoyable uh, resolution for everybody. Yeah. Uh, I also want to say that, you know, I, I was uh, dunking on Anthony Mackie, but I'm not a huge fan of Sebastian Stan either. I, I haven't seen him in a lot of stuff, but the stuff I have seen him in, he just doesn't really have a lot of spark, it feels like. And, you know, I, I liked him better as a villain than when he was sort of the anti-hero. So going into the show, I, I really had reservations about the two lead actors. And the show did a good job of building up a lot of characters around these guys that, that helped a lot. But also I was won over more by this show on Sebastian Stan than I have on anything else. So both Mackie and Stan benefited from this. I liked his relationships with people. I liked that he's the guy who's always ending up on people's couches, it seems like. Uh, I love that you get to see through his eyes uh, how um, Sam's nephews just can't keep their hands off the shield and how enamored with it they are. And again, when uh, Mackie, uh, as Sam is uh, training to be Captain America, uh, how the, the boys are looking at him and seeing him become an even greater hero than he already was as a Falcon and, and becoming more of that, like moving from a B list to an A list, or I think to some degree, but being that representative, being that, that true blue hero, I think it meant a lot to those boys and getting to see that through uh, Bucky's eyes and to, to see to some degree, like not only is he seeing what's happening with the nephews that Sam isn't seeing, but he's also seeing Sam become the person that Steve thought he could be and finds uh, hope and redemption through seeing the transformation that Sam is going through. That was endearing. But also again, I love that he's the guy who gets invited to the picnic. I loved his flirtation with Sarah Wilson. I also love that actress. I think that character is great. When I watched the first episode, I was like, I like Sarah way more than I like Sam. Give her the shield, you know? Um, I, I love that the sense of community this show has too, where they bring everybody together to work on the boat and then they're all together at the end as well. And uh, there was a greater, like a lot of times when you bring in the, the supporting players and the, you know, the, the regular people, it's really corny. Like I remember, I think it was the, the first or second Spider-Man movie where like see Thomas Howell and all the people are maneuvering the crane so that Spidey can get across some shit or other. I don't know. It's it, all that. All, usually when they do that shit, it's super fucking corny. But for some reason, because they built up the the Wilson parents and what they meant to the community and I, I don't know, just a matter of the performances and the relatability of um, uh, uh, Bucky being like the, the weird uncle that's kind of hanging out with the kids in the background and shit and flirting with Sarah. It, it just felt a lot more organic and true and I just really dug that. So I, I've got my issues with the show and I still think that it's a better TV show than it would be if they try to take it into a movie but there's so much good stuff in here that while I'm I'm unwilling to ignore the problematic areas of the show and the stuff that I don't think really works so much of it does work that I'm, I'm still 100% for watching this going forward. I'm, I'm still a fan of this material. I was certainly a fan of them continuing to draw from the uh, Captain America canon even with Captain America as I know him Steve Rogers isn't there. They find such inventive ways of doing it and I, I really enjoy the work of the showrunner. I enjoyed the work of the director. I, I would like to see a lot more from these people. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm ultimately it's still a big thumbs up with with some misgivings, but ultimately still I'm a fan. Wow. Well, why? Wow. I what mean, did you think about it, Mr. Fix? I mean, I, I enjoyed it very much. I, you know, no, I, I just it's, I'm not used to hearing Frank like something. <laughs> oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And so I was waiting for him to like, but and it just fucking ravaged it because it didn't have Wonder Woman or some shit in it. So. 
So <laughs> hey, I would, just to hear him say it, I'm like, whoa, wow, okay. Yeah, I mean, I enjoyed it. I liked it. I liked the direction. I, I definitely liked it way better than uh, WandaVision. Um, and I'm looking forward to Loki. I got to say, too, I think this is a much better story about dealing with mental illness and mental issues than WandaVision. I really do feel like so much WandaVision ultimately still leaves this, this person who's having problems demonized and uh, affording her a leeway that she did not earn through her actions. I, I like that they let you know that this Winter Soldier has done some fucked up shit and there are people that can never potentially forgive him for that and there, maybe there's no way he can ever make it right but he's trying and they're showing him actually going to therapy and, and backsliding and then making progress. I, I think there's just a way better depiction of, of mental illness uh, than WandaVision by far. Yeah. Well and also at the end when you see him walk up and the elderly gentleman is in the bar eating and the girl sees him you don't know if he's been forgiven or what. Like you don't know what their interaction was. Yeah that's true they live that open and like yeah. is he going to come back and see her again because they had a pretty good first date or whatever or, or was that sort of a nod like well this chapter's closed never seeing these people again and then head yeah out. that's kind of what I felt it was like yeah like you know this is done I agree I think it was more about him checking in on the old man and making sure that he's got a support network and, and seeing how he's doing now that he knows the truth about what happened to his son I don't see him picking up with the girl again but I don't think th- if she's got any sense she wouldn't have anything to do with him either well yeah because he's moved on to, to Falcon's sister Duh. that too yeah Duh. That's true. That's I love true. that flirtation, man. I, I, I really would like to see that uh, relationship progress. I, I love the whole uh, boat repairing montage. The montage, that was, really? that was all That was all great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, dude, where you, they get the whole neighborhood out there to work on the boat and everything, and I, I thought all that was great. I, there was just a tons that I just loved about the series, where I, I from week to week with WandaVision, I was sort of like, okay, like, I, I mean, that was cool, but like, what, I, I feel like we're building to something, and then like I said, it kind of never really happened. Where this one, like, I legit, like, I'm telling you, dude, the, the cliffhanger at the end of was it episode four where uh johnny walker chops that dude up it is one of the in my opinion one of my favorite mcu moments i mean i I was like why can't i just watch the next episode now like i was i could not wait until the next friday to watch episode five uh and and i don't think there was any moment in wandavision that had me like that where i was just like oh i can't wait to see what happens abigail all along yeah Yeah, and like that no (laughs) No. um so for that alone this the show got a big thumbs up for me i i'm just like i said once in episode six we're kind of confronted with with, you know, where does this series go from here? Uh, it's like, oh, they've resolved. All, all of the best parts of this show got resolved, right? His stuff with Isaiah, they resolved it at the end. Uh, the Winter Soldier's, you know, brain trauma and, and PTSD kind of gets resolved by the end. You know what I mean? Like, uh, the boat gets resolved at the end. You know what I'm saying? And I'm just like, yeah. okay, well, those those were all my favorite parts. So, like, what, what are we... Him being Captain America is really not any of my favorite part of the show. Even Johnny Walker kind of got resolved at the end so i'm not i would have if this was going to be a season two i'd be kind of nervous uh and then for them to try and do this in a movie would be freaking crazy unless they're gonna end up setting up something crazy like uh like you said the contessa's actually bizarro nick fury and she's assembling her own set of heroes for sword or for some other uh and she's it's gonna be the dark avengers or whatever I, to me that i'm okay i guess i'm down for that but um you know w- without any of these existing tangents uh unresolved I, you know like i don't really care about sharing Carter is the power broker. I mean, I guess that works for her character, but I'm not like, is season two going to be all about them fighting Sharon Carter? Hope not. That doesn't sound great to me. Uh, I mean, Zemo's got to go somewhere, I guess, although he's still locked up. Are they going to spring him again for season two? Like, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm definitely, I, as much as I, I liked this season, I, the sixth episode really made, would make me nervous for whatever would follow it. Well, my so. thing, too, is it's clear that WandaVision is going pretty much directly into Doctor Strange. So, it's it, it, that very and then and also that uh, the Monica Rambeau story is going to continue either on some of the other TV shows or in Captain Marvel 2 so that's that's very clear there's not a lot of ambiguity in, in those aspects with this show I get the feeling I mean, there there is that that lack of resolution it feels like because all these guys are kind of continuing on their merry ways I feel like this show probably has more to do with setting up the other TV shows I feel like Power Broker is going to be in the next Falcon and Winter or Captain America and Winter Soldier thing I think she's going to turn up in one of the other Marvel shows I think that the contest is going to continue to pop up in Marvel shows. I, I think that this is a launching pad for a lot of other stuff that's going to happen in a lot of other places. I, I really think it would be a bad idea. <laughs> I'm glad we pulled it together. Like we were going into this, uh, we were on rocky ground, but I think we all kind of got livened up as over the course of the discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Low Energy Frank here. Was that last edit really obvious? Don't read Vanity Fair if you don't want contested spoilers. Just saying. Permanent Marvelite Maximus followers include Abyssal Albion, Citizen Kane Minute, Comics and Vinyl, Double Lloyd, Gorilla Film History Now, The Master of the Galaxy, MD, Nick Spence, Tony Nasser, Flag of Australia, and Weird Warriors Podcast. Fearless Facebook front facers include Debesh, Mike Peacock, and Eric William Crabb, who included a Berserker Barrage gift. Our retweet Frantic ones are Dr. Ange, Firestorm fan, relatively geeky and talk nerdy to me. Keepers of the favorites flame include Alejandro, Canoes, Chris Dunford, Double Lloyd, Dragon Prime, Edward Huey, Fan Holes Podcast, Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast, Omar de Oliveira, Jennifer DeRoss, Keith G. Baker, King Dinosaur, King Size Comics, Giant Size Fun Podcast, Hulkling, Hashtag Black Lives Matter, John Kialo Mulinj, John is Watching Cartoons, The Master of the Galaxy, Max Reads Comics, MB, Mohamed Bashamak, Felipe Goncalves, Quedinum, Richard Field, Tony Nola, Trans Lesbian Planet Eater, Wacky Bronze Silver Bronze... Uh, shit, sorry. <laughs> Wacky Bronze Silver Comic Book Villains and Xenozoic Xenophiles. Among our enough sayers was Jenna Reagan, who wrote, Ooh, nice. Wolver Steve said, Cool stuff, quality. This is, of course, related to our Wolverine episode. Richard G. wrote, Love being included with other folks that love superheroes as much as I do. Great to have a shared passion. Stay strong, safe, and Hero One. Michael Wagner wrote, Love Fixits Alimantium. Best part of Wolverine Talk. What's the tea on Illegal Machines beef with Thierry? Stay tuned for our big Joe Quesada, Frank Thierry era Iron Man podcast in 20 fucking whenever. Probably never going to happen. 20, 30 something? 2030. Yeah, we'll go for that. CH. Instead of Bish, uh, this is um, on the tweet that was announcing the podcast. Uh, I said, Swish Swish Bish. Or no, it was Snick Snick Bish. I probably haven't been drinking. This is just Pepsi Zero in my uh, in my mouth. Uh, I, of course, took this from Katy Perry because Ryan Daly and his brother Neil uh, recently had a podcast on Taylor Swift. And I was going to make a joke about how they have to do a Katy Perry podcast for equal time. And then I decided not to do that because I didn't really want the association with Katy Perry. I like her fine, but I like her better than Taylor Swift, but not really like showing up for her in a big stanny way. But because I'd listened to a bunch of her latter day material to see how she was holding up not well I have to tell you I had her, her diss track swish swish bitch in, in mind and so I did snick stick bitch and uh, CH is pointing out that instead of bish should have went with bub but I don't think anybody would have gotten snick snick bub uh, and not that there was anything really to get I'll own that CH also wrote uh, you'll send the nerds into a fit without the small yet very important to the fate of all mankind comics facts continuity I wish I was drinking I think this would go smoother and I'd probably have more energy drunk energy but energy nonetheless River and Odell Abner Dracula wrote you guys skip the Walt Simonson Arthur Adams new Fantastic Four arc and you're reading histories all three of you yeah don't get me wrong the Art Adams art is awesome on that arc but when you're talking about almost a 50 year history of a single character uh, the three issues four issues whatever it was uh, it doesn't really rate that high in the uh, impactometer but yeah that would be a fun one to read and cover on an episode it'd be nice if we maybe covered some comic books for a change but much like how I'm not even considering bringing back the the Marvel Handbook podcast because like literally every other week there's a new Marvel television show or movie and there's just no oxygen if I don't want to do anything but Marvel shit all this year so probably won't happen soon also there's a lot of 10th anniversaries finally uh, Mike writes so this is Mike it's send aliens to me the best live action gambit I could have hoped for was in the first Wolverine film so I end up overrating that film to many people I am sure but I don't care that movie is good by me and uh, I'm a big stand for late life Chris Claremont creations like Gambit so I I wasn't blown away by Taylor Kitsch is that right? I don't remember I'm drawing from memory I really should have drank I wasn't blown away by his rendition of Gambit but I was looking forward to Charming Potatoes take on the character and it's unfortunate that with the Fox absorption we're never going to get to see a Gambit solo movie anytime soon it seems like actually I would rather see him in the context of the X-Men but you know what I mean when Gambit started doing solo stories that's when he but I'll save that for the Gambit podcast 2031. And finally... 
the Merry Marching Society of the Marvel Superhero Podcast. The one at eight Sage, Austin Kirkendall, Baby Skeletor, CH, Chris Lydon, Dave's Comic Heroes Blog, Doc Strange, Dirk Ashton, Green Lantern HG, The Hammer Strikes, Geeky Stuff and VoiceOver, History of Comics on Film, oh look, Omar De Oliveira, okay, so he's in the Marching Society, not just the favorites, missed that, also surely butchered the pronunciation of that name, I was Joe Crawford, Jason Snick Venable, Jeffrey Brown, they, them, who, by the way, sent us a picture of the X-Men Earthfall one-shot, which collected all the parts of the X-Men brood story that Mark Silvestri did. Jenna Reagan, Maz Riasat, Riasat, chime up, please. A little help. Marvel Universe Online, Mike at Send Alias to Me, Randy Caldwell, Resurrections and Adam Warlock and Thanos Podcast, Reverend Odell Abner Dracula, Richard G, Ronnie Casal, Ryan Daly, Tim Price Podcrasher, Tony Scipioni, Tora, Oofda, Wolver Steve, and Zwick Jameson. This has been a non-for-profit fan production from Rolled Spine Podcast. Any copyrighted material presented herein are presumed covered under fair use, with no infringement intended. Fuck me, that was almost ten minutes of recording? I ain't fucking editing this shit. Send it to the Marvel Animation uh, sound effect. <laughs> Are you ass white? Yeah, people? ass white. Who the fuck are you? <laughs> it's the Falcon. I'm the Falcon. President Reagan's hired assassin. Ass white. <laughs> we got you the bird, pal. This is not my bird. What do you mean? That's the bird. This is the bird. Yeah. Pull a lot of streets to get this bird. This is a great bird. It's a beautiful bird. We got this all the way from Russia. Hey, man, please stop my bullet. So then the government names this guy John Walker as the new Captain America. Oh, I hate this guy already. He actually doesn't seem like such a bad guy. Oh, but he's such a bad guy. Okay. But he's not that bad eventually, kinda. I, I, but not great. Oh, I don't know how to feel about this guy, but I'm captivated. Anyway, so then we're gonna find out about this terrorist organization called the Flag Smashers. And what's their deal? Well, they want the world to go back to the way it was before everyone was snapped back, because everything's all messed up now. Messed up how? Well, this organization called the Global Repatriation Council are trying to get things back the way they were before the blip because now people are living in each other's houses There are refugees. It's a mess. And so what's their plan? Oh, well about 20 of them have taken super soldier serum and their plan is to get out there and you j Go get you know go get go get it done. What they're gonna head out there go get at get it all taken care of I don't get what it what listen sir. They have a vague plan probably I'm gonna need you to get all the way off my back about what it is exactly Oh, Okay, let me get off of that thing anyway So their leaders the surprisingly young lady, Carly Morgenthau, and she wears a mask and she's like mean, but you kind of get where she's coming from. It's just that her methods are questionable. Oh, sounds a lot like that Enfys Nest character from Solo, A Star Wars Story. Oh yeah, I guess it does. Well, we'll make sure to make it different enough. Okay, good. Who should we get to play her? How about that Enfys Nest actress from Solo, A Star Wars Story? Oh yeah, she's great. Good call. Great. So what's her deal? Why does everybody look up to her? Well, because she keeps saying things like, our movement is strong. Okay. It's time to make ourselves heard. Alright, is she like super charismatic or something? No, she just quietly says vague things and everyone's really into that apparently. Well, okay then. So what else is going on in the show? Yeah, so they head to this city called Madripoor because they want to find out where the super soldier serum's being made. Right. And while they're there, they're gonna meet Sharon Carter. She's from the movies. She is. And there's this mysterious person in Madripoor called the Power Broker and we don't know who it is. Is it Mephisto? What? No. Sorry, I'm still a little riled up from the WandaVision pitch. No, this Power Broker person seems to be a very influential person in Madripoor. They're pulling a bunch of strings. They have crazy access to stuff. Okay. Anyway, so Sharon Carter seems to be a pretty influential person in Madripoor. She's pulling a bunch of strings. She has crazy access to stuff. Oh, so Sharon is the power broker. What? No. Yeah, I feel like with the clues you've laid out, though. It's not. Mm -mm, nobody knows who the power broker is. I feel like it's pretty obviously her, though. Also, Zemo's gonna put on his purple mask from the comics. Oh, why does he put that on? Because it's gonna look good in the trailers. Can't argue with that. And so Carly sets a truck of hostage is on fire. Okay, so we're done trying to paint her in a sympathetic light, right? No, we're still trying. She's... Oh, she's... 
Okay. And get this, we're gonna find out that Sharon is the power broker. Right, yeah, I figured that out. No, you didn't. Who else would it have- This is a big twist that I wrote. Okay. So then Sam is gonna show up, and he has this new Captain America flight suit that the Wakandans made for him. Oh, he does? Yeah, this thing's great. He's fully protected, except the top of his head where his brain is. Oh, protecting everything except your brain cage is tight. And so eventually Carly's gonna be trying really hard to kill Sam because she's a sympathetic character, and then Sharon's gonna shoot her dead, so it's very- very sad. Is it? And then Sam's gonna carry her body, cause it's definitely a sad moment, and then he's gonna talk to some senators. Oh, he is? Yeah, he's gonna be like, stop calling the Flag Smashers terrorists. Well, I mean, they literally used violence and intimidation against civilians in pursuit of political aims, which is... You know, the definition of terrorism. Yeah, well, Sam's gonna tell them to not say that, and then he's gonna keep lecturing them for four to five minutes. Okay. And one of the senators gonna be like, okay, but logistically, what are we supposed to do here? And Sam's gonna be like, do better, senator. Oh, uh, you know, that does sound like it's gonna help a lot. It is. Wow, 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 wow. And so then Sam's gonna make sure that Isaiah's story gets told. Nice. And then Bucky's gonna go talk to Yuri and tell him what he did to his son. Oh, it's gonna be nice to see how that plays out. Then we cut away. Oh. Yeah, we get out of there fast. Kinda wish he let that moment break. Nope, I'm already gone before we even get to see the moment I've been building up to all season. Okay. And then during the end credits, we're gonna have the title card say Captain America and the Winter Soldier, so that's gonna be a nice moment for Sam, you know? Hasn't Bucky's whole arc been about not being the Winter Soldier anymore? Uh, yeah, I guess I could've changed his title too, huh? Whoops! Whoopsie! 